Chapter 9 The Policy of the Closed Door The disasters and humiliations that befell me at Romcurran Fair may yet be remembered. They certainly have not been forgotten in the regions of Baskerborn, where the tale of how Bernard Chute and I stole each other's horses has passed into history. The granddaughter of the mountain hare, bought by Mr. Chute with such light-hearted enthusiasm, was restored to that position between the shafts of a cart that she was so well fitted to grace. Moonlighter, his other purchase, spent the two months following on the fair in favouring a leg with a strained sinew and in receiving visits from the local vet, who, however uncertain in his diagnosis of Moonlighter's leg, had accurately estimated the length of Bernard's foot. Mitz Bennett's mare, Krushkin, alone of the trio, was immediately and thoroughly successful. She went in harness like a hero. She carried Philippa like an elder sister. She was never sick or sorry. As Peter Cadogan summed her up, that one had lived where another had died. In her safekeeping, Philippa made her debut with hounds at an uneventful morning's cubbing with no particular result except that Philippa returned home so stiff that she had to go to bed for a day and arose more determined than ever to be a fox hunter. The opening meet of Mr. Knox's foxhounds was on the 1st of November and on that morning Philippa and Krushkin, accompanied by me on the Quaker, set out for Ardmean Cross, the time-honoured fixture for All Saints' Day. The weather was grey and quiet and full of all the moist sweetness of an Irish autumn. There had been a great deal of rain during the past month. It had turned the bracken to a purple-brown and had filled the hollows with shining splashes of water. The dead leaves were slippery underfoot and the branches above were thinly decked with yellow where the pallid survivors of summer still clung to their posts. As Philippa and I sedately approached the meet, the red coats of Flurry Knox and his whip, Dr. Jerome Hickey, were to be seen on the road at the top of the hill. Krushin put her head in the air and stared at them with eyes that understood all they portended. Sinclair, said my wife hurriedly, as a straggling hound flogged in by Dr. Hickey uttered a grievous and melodious howl, Remember, if they find, it's no use to talk to me, for I shan't be able to speak. I was sufficiently acquainted with Philippa in moments of enthusiasm to exhibit silently the corner of a clean pocket handkerchief. I have seen her cry when a police constable won a bicycle race in Scobon, and she has wept at hearing Sir Valentine Knox's health drunk with musical honours at a tennis dinner. It is an amiable custom, but, as she herself admits, it is unbecoming. An imposing throng, in point of numbers, was gathered at the crossroads, the riders being almost swamped in the crowd of traps, outside cars, bicyclists and people on foot. The field was an eminently representative one. The Tan Knox was, as usual, there in force, its more aristocratic members dingily respectable in black coats and tall hats that went impartially to weddings, funerals and hunts and, like a horse that has passed mark of mouth, were no longer to be identified with any special epoch. There was a humbler squireine element in tweeds and flat brim pot hats and a good muster of farmers, men of the spare black-muzzled West of Ireland type on horses that ranged from the cart mare, clip trace high, to shaggy and leggy three-year-olds, none of them hunters, but all of them able to hunt. Philippa and I worked our way to the heart of things where was Flurry, seated on his brown mare, in what appeared to be a somewhat moody silence. As we exchanged greetings, I was aware that his eye was resting with extreme disfavour upon two approaching figures. I put up my eyeglass and perceived that one of them was Miss Sally Knox on a tall grey horse. The other was Mr Bernard Shute 
in all the flawless beauty of his first pink coat, mounted on stockbroker, a well-known, hard-mouthed, big-jumping bay, recently purchased from Dr. Hickey. During the languors of a damp autumn, the neighbourhood had been much nourished and sustained by the privilege of observing and diagnosing the progress of Mr. Shute's flirtation with Miss Sally Knox. What made it all the more enjoyable for the lookers-on, or most of them, was that although Bernard's courtship was of the nature of a proclamation from the housetops, Miss Knox's attitude left everything to the imagination. To Flurry Knox, the romantic but despicable position of slighted rival was comfortably allotted. His sole sympathisers were Philippa and old Mrs Knox of Ossalas. But no one knew if he needed sympathisers. Flurry was a man of mystery. Mr Shute and Miss Knox approached us rapidly, the latter's mount pulling hard. Uh, Flurry... I said, isn't that grey the horse shoot bought from you last July at the fair? Flurry did not answer me. His face was as black as thunder. He turned his horse round, cursing two country boys who got in his way, with low and concentrated venom, and began to move forward, followed by the hounds. If his wish was to avoid speaking to Miss Sally, it was not to be gratified. Good morning, Flurry, she began, sitting close down to Moonlighter's ramping jog as she rode up beside her cousin. What a hurry you're in. <laughs> we pass no end of people on the road <laughs> who won't be here for another ten minutes. No more will I, was Mr. Knox's cryptic reply as he spurred the brown mare into a trot. Moonlighter, made a vigorous but frustrated effort to buck and indemnified himself by a successful kick at a hound. Bother you, Flurry. Can't you walk for a minute? exclaimed Miss Sally, who looked about as large in relation to her horse as the conventional tomtit on a round of beef. You might have more sense than to crack your whip under this horse's nose. I don't believe you know what horse it is, even. I was not near enough to catch Flurry's reply. Well, if you didn't want him to be lent to me, you shouldn't have sold him to Mr. Shute, retorted Miss Knox in her clear, provoking little voice. I suppose he's afraid to ride him himself, said Flurry, turning his horse in at a gate. Get ahead there, Jerome, can't you? It's better to put them in at this end than to have everyone riding on top of them. Miss Sally's cheeks were still very pink when I came up and began to talk to her, and her grey-green eyes had a look in them like those of an angry kitten. The riders moved slowly down a rough pasture field and took up their position along the brow of Ardmean covert, into which the hounds had already hurled themselves with their customary contempt for the convenance. Flurry's hounds, true to their nationality, but in the habit of doing the right thing in the wrong way. Untouched by autumn, the firs bushes of Ardmean covered were darkly green, save for a golden fleck of blossom here and there, and the glistening grey cobwebs that stretched from spike to spike. The look of the ordinary gorse covered is familiar to most people as a tidy enclosure of an acre or so, filled with low plants of well-educated gorse. Not so many will be found who have experience of it as a rocky, sedgy wilderness, half a mile square, garrisoned with brigades of firs bushes, some of them higher than a horse's head, lean, strong and cunning, like the foxes that breed in them, impenetrable, with their bristling spikes as a hedge of bayonets. By dint of infinite leisure and obstinate greed, the cattle had made paths for themselves through the bushes to the patches of grass that they hemmed in. Their hoof prints were guides to the explorer, down muddy staircases of rock and across black intervals of unplumbed bog. The whole covert slanted gradually down to a small river that raced round three sides of it 
and beyond the stream, in agreeable contrast, lay a clean and wholesome country of grass fields and banks. The hounds drew slowly along and down the hill towards the river, and the riders hung about outside the covert and tried, I can answer for at least one of them, to decide which was the least odious of the ways through it in the event of the fox breaking at the far side. Miss Sally took up a position not very far from me, and it was easy to see that she had her hands full with her borrowed mount, on whose temper the delay and suspense were visibly telling. His iron-grey neck was white from the chafing of the reins. Had the ground under his feet been red-hot, he could hardly have sidled and hopped more uncontrollably. Nothing but the most impassioned conjugation of the verb to condemn could have supplied any human equivalent for the manner in which he tore holes in the sedgy grass with a furious forefoot. Those who were even superficial judges of character gave his heels a liberal allowance of sea room, and Mr. Shute, who could not be numbered among such, and had, as usual, taken up a position as near Miss Sally as possible, was rewarded by a double knock on his horse's ribs that was a cause of heartless mirth to the lady of his affection. Not a hound had as yet spoken, but they were forcing their way through the gorse forest and shoving each other jealously aside with growing excitement. And Fleury could be seen at intervals, moving forward in the direction they were indicating. It was at this juncture that the ubiquitous slipper presented himself at my horse's shoulder. "'Tis for the river he's making, Major." he said with an upward roll of his squinting eyes that nearly made me seasick. He's a castle ox fox that came in this morning, and ye should get ahead down to the ford. A tip from Slipper was not to be neglected, and Philippa and I began a cautious progress through the gorse, followed by Miss Knox, as quietly as Moonlighter's nerves would permit. Wishful has it, she exclaimed, as a hound came out into view, uttered a sharp yelp, and drove forward. Hark! Hark! roared Flurry, with at least three R's reverberating in each hark. At the same instant came a hullo from the farther side of the river, and Dr. Hickey's renowned and blood-curdling screech was uplifted at the bottom of the covert. Then Babel broke forth as the hounds, converging from every quarter, flung themselves, shrieking, on the line. Moonlighter went straight up on his hind legs and dropped again with a bound that sent him crushing past Philippa and Krushchin. He did it a second time and was almost on to the tail of the Quaker, whose bulky person was not to be hurried in any emergency. Get on if you can, Major Yates, called out Sally steadying in the grey as well as she could in the narrow pathway between the great gorse bushes. Other horses were thundering behind us. Men were shouting to each other in similar passages right and left of us. The cry of the hounds filled the air with a kind of delirium. A low wall with a stick laid along it barred the passage in front of me, and the Quaker firmly and immediately decided not to have it until someone else had dislodged the pole. Uh, go ahead, I shouted, squeezing to one side with heroic disregard of the firs, bushes, and my new tops. The words were hardly out of my mouth when Moonlighter, mad with thwarted excitement, shot by me, hurtled over the obstacle with extravagant fury, landed twelve feet beyond it on clattering, slippery rock, saved himself from falling with an eel-like forward buck onto sedgy ground, and bolted at full speed down the muddy cattle track. There are corners, rocky most of them in that cattle track, that Sally has told me she will remember to her dying day. Boggy holes of any depth, ranging between two feet and halfway to Australia, that she says she does not fail to mention in the general thanksgiving but at the time they occupied mere fractions of the strenuous seconds in which it was hopeless for her to do anything but try to steer, trust to luck, sit hard down into the saddle, and try to stay there. For my part, 
I would as soon try to adhere to the horns of a charging bull as to the crutches of a side saddle. But happily, the necessity is not likely to arise. I saw Furry Knox, a little ahead of her, on the same track, jamming his mare into the firs bushes to get out of her way. He shouted something after her about the ford and started to gallop for it himself by a breakneck shortcut. The hounds were already across the river, and it was obvious that ford or no ford, Moonlighter's intentions might be simply expressed in the formula, Be with them, I will. It was all downhill to the river, and among the firs, bushes and rocks, there was neither time nor place to turn him. He rushed at it with a shattering slip upon a streak of rock, with a heavy plunge on the deep ground by the brink. It was as bad a take-off for twenty feet of water as could well be found. The grey horse rose out of the boggy stuff with all the impetus that pace and temper could give, but it was not enough. For one instant, the twisting, sliding current was under Sally, the next... A veil of water sprang up all round her, and Moonlighter was rolling and lurching in the desperate effort to find foothold in the rocky bed of the stream. I was following at the best pace I could kick out of the Quaker, and saw the water swirl into her lap as her horse rolled to the near side. She caught the mane to save herself, but he struggled onto his legs again and came floundering broadside on to the further bank. In three seconds, she had got out of the saddle and flung herself at the bank, grasping the rushes and trying, in spite of the sodden weight of her habit, to drag herself out of the water. At the same instant, I saw Flurry and the brown mare dashing through the ford twenty yards higher up. He was off his horse and beside her with that uncanny quickness that Flurry reserved for moments of emergency, and catching her by the arms swung her on to the bank as easily as if she had been the kennel terrier. Catch the horse! She called out, scrambling to her feet. Damn the horse! returned Flurry, in the rage that is so often the reaction from a bad scare. I turned along the bank and made for the ford. By this time it was full of hustling, splashing riders, through whom Bernard Shute, furiously picking up a bad start, drove a devastating way. He tried to turn his horse down the bank towards Miss Knox, but the hounds were running hard, and to my intense amusement, Stockbroker refused to abandon the chase and swept his rider away in the wake of his stable companion, Dr. Hickey's young chestnut. By this time, two country boys had, as is usual in such cases, risen from the earth and fished Moonlighter out of the stream. Miss Sally wound up an acrimonious argument with her cousin by observing that she didn't care what he said, and placing her waterlogged boot in his obviously unwilling hand, in a second was again in the saddle, gathering up the wet reins with the trembling, clumsy fingers of a person who is thoroughly chilled and in a violent hurry. She set Moonlight a-going and was away in a moment, galloping him at the first fence at a pace that suited his steeple-chasing ideas. Mr. Knox, panted Philippa, who had by this time joined us. Make her go home. She can go as she likes, as far as I'm concerned, responded Mr. Knox, pitching himself onto his mare's back and digging in the spurs. Moonlighter had already glided over the bank in front of us with a perfunctory flick at it with his heels. Flurry's mare and Krushkin jumped at side by side with equal precision. It was a bank of some five feet high. The Quaker charged it enthusiastically, refused it abruptly, and, according to his infuriating custom at such moments, proceeded to tear hurried mouthfuls of grass. Will I give him a couple of bells, Your Honor? shouted one of the running accompaniment of country boys. You will, said I, with some further remarks to the Quaker that I need not commit to paper. Swish! Whack! 
The sound was music in my ears as the good remorseless ash sapling bent round the Quaker's dappled hindquarters. At the third stripe, he launched both his heels and the operator's face. At the fourth, he reared undecidedly. At the fifth, he bundled over the bank in a manner purged of hesitation. Ha! yelled my assistants. That'll put the fear of God in him. As the Quaker fled headlong after the hunt, he'll be the better of that while he lives. Without going quite as far as this, I must admit that for the next half hour, he was astonishingly the better of it. The Cassinox fox was making a very pretty line of it over the seven miles that separated him from his home. He headed through a grassy country of Ireland's mild and brilliant green, fenced with sand and buxom banks, enlivened by stone walls, uncompromised by the presence of gates, and yet comfortably laced with lanes for the furtherance of those who had laid to heart Woolsey's valuable advice. Fling away ambition. By that sin fell the angels. The fotsam and jetsam of the hunt pervaded the landscape. Standing on one long bank, three dismounted farmers flogged away at the refusing steeds below them, like anglers trying to rise a sulky fish. Half a dozen hats, bobbing in a string, showed where the road rider followed the delusive windings of a boreen. It was obvious that in the matter of ambition, they would not have caused Cardinal Woolsey a moment's uneasiness. Whether angels or otherwise, they were not going to run any risk of falling. Flurry's red coat was like a beacon, two fields ahead of me, with Philippa following in his tracks. It was the first run worthy of the name that Philippa had ridden, and I blessed Miss Bobby Bennett as I saw Khrushchev's undefeated fencing. An encouraging twang of the doctor's horn notified that the hounds were giving us a chance. Even the Quaker pricked his blunt ears and swerved in his stride to the sound. A stone wall, a rough patch of heather, a boggy field dinted deep and black with hoof marks, and the stern chase was at an end. The hounds had checked on the outskirts of a small wood, and the field thinned down to a panting dozen or so, viewed us with the disfavour shown by the first flight towards those who unexpectedly add to their select number. In the depths of the wood, Dr Hickey might be heard uttering those singular little yelps of encouragement that to the irreverent suggest a milkman in his dotage. Bernard Shute, who neither knew nor cared what the hounds were doing, was expatiating at great length to an uninterested squireen upon the virtues and perfections of his new mount. I did all I knew to come and help you at the river, he said, riding up to the splashed and still dripping Sally. But Stockbroker wouldn't hear of it. I pulled his ugly head round till his nose was on my boot, but he galloped away just the same. He was quite right, said Miss Sally. I didn't want you in the least. As Miss Sally's red gold coil of hair was turned towards me during the speech, I could only infer the glance with which it was delivered from the fact that Mr. Shute responded to it with one of those firm gazes of adoration in which the neighbourhood took such an interest and crumbled away into incoherency. A shout from the top of a hill interrupted the amenities of the check. Flory was out of the wood in half a dozen seconds, blowing shattering blasts upon his horn, and the hounds rushed to him, knowing the gone-away note that was never blown in vain. The brown mare came out through the trees and the undergrowth like a woodcock down the wind and jumped across a stream onto a more than questionable bank. The hounds splashed and struggled after her, and as they landed, the first ecstatic whimpers broke forth. In a moment, it was full cry, discordant, beautiful, 
and soul-stirring as the pack sped and sped and settled to the line. I saw the absurd dazzle of tears in Philippa's eyes and found time for the insulting proffer of the clean pocket handkerchief as we all galloped hard to get away on good terms with the hounds. It was one of those elect moments in fox hunting when the fittest alone have survived. Even the Quaker's sluggish blood was stirred by good company and possibly by the remembrance of the singing ash plant and he lumbered up tall stone-faced banks and down heavy drops and across wide ditches in astounding adherence to the line cut out by Flurry. Krushkin went like a book, a story for girls, very pleasant and safe, but rather slow. Moonlight was pulling Miss Sally onto the sterns of the hounds, flying his banks, rocketing like a pheasant over three-foot walls, committing, in fact, all the crimes induced by youth and overfeeding. He would have done very comfortably with another six or seven stone on his back. Why Bernard Shute did not come off at every fence and generally die a thousand deaths, I cannot explain. Occasionally, I rather wished he would, as from my secure position in the rear, I saw him charging his fences at whatever pace and place seemed good to the thoroughly demoralized stockbroker and, in so doing, cannon heavily against Dr. Hickey on landing over a rotten ditch jump a wall with the spur roweling Charlie Knox's boot and cut in at top speed in front of Flurry, who was, scientifically, cramming his mare up a very awkward scramble. Insofar as I could think of anything beyond Philippa and myself and the next fence, I thought there would be trouble for Mr. Shute in consequence of this last feat. It was a half-hour long to be remembered, in spite of the Quaker's ponderous and unalterable gallop, in spite of the thump with which he came down off his banks, in spite of the confiding manner in which he hung upon my hand. We were nearing Castle Knox, and the riders began to edge away from the hounds towards a gate that broke the long barrier of the domain wall. Steaming horses and purple-faced riders clattered and crashed in at the gate, there was a moment of pulling up and listening in which quivering tails and pumping sides told their own story. Krushkin's breathing suggested a cross between a grampus and a gramophone. Philippa's hair had come down and she had a stitch in her side. Moonlighter, fresher than ever, stamped and dragged at his bit. I thought little Miss Sally looked very white. The bewildering clamour of the hounds was all through the wide laurel plantations. At a word from Flurry, Dr. Hickey shoved his horse ahead and turned down a ride, followed by most of the field. Philippa, I said severely, you've had enough, and you know it. Do go up to the house and make them give you something to eat, stuck in Miss Sally, twisting Moonlighter around to keep his mind occupied. And as for you, Miss Sally, I went on in the manner of Mr. Fairchild, the sooner you get off that horse and out of those wet things, the better. Flurry, who was just in front of us, said nothing, but gave a short and most disagreeable laugh. Philippa accepted my suggestion with the meekness of exhaustion, but in the circumstances, it did not surprise me that Miss Sally did not follow her example. Then ensued an hour of woodland hunting at its worst, and most bewildering. I galloped after Flurry and Miss Sally, up and down long glittering lanes of laurel at every other moment, burying my face in the Quaker's coarse white mane to avoid the slash of the branches, and receiving down the back of my neck showers of drops stored up from the rain of the day before, playing an endless game of hide-and-seek with the hounds, and never getting any nearer to them as they turned and doubled through the thickets of evergreens. Even to my limited understanding of the situation, it became clear at length that two foxes were on foot. Most of the hounds were hard at work, 
a quarter of a mile away, but Flurry, with a grim face and a faithful three-couple, stuck to the failing line of the hunted fox. There came a moment when Miss Sally and I, who, through many vicissitudes, had clung to each other, found ourselves at a spot where two rides crossed. Flurry was waiting there, and a little way up one of the rides, a couple of hounds were hustling to and fro with thwarted whimpers, half breaking from them. He held up his hand to stop us, and at that identical moment, Bernard shoot, like a bolt from the blue, burst upon our vision. It need scarcely be mentioned that he was going at full gallop. I have rarely seen him ride at any other pace, and as he bore down upon Flurry and the hounds, ducking and dodging to avoid the branches, he shouted something about a fox having gone away at the other side of the covert. Hold hard! roared Flurry. Don't you see the hounds, you fool? Mr. Chute, to do him justice, held hard with all the strength in his body, but it was of no avail. The bay horse had got his head down and his tail up. There was a piercing yell from a hound as it was ridden over, and Flurry's brown mare will not soon forget the moment when Stockbroker's shoulder took her on the point of the hip and sent her staggering into the laurel branches. As she swung round, Flurry's whip went up, and with a swift backhander, the cane and the looped thong caught Bernard across his broad shoulders. Oh, Mr. Shoot! shrieked Sally as I stared dumbfounded. Did that branch hurt you? All right, nothing to signify, he called out as he bucketed past, tugging at his horse's head. Thought someone had hit me at first. Come on, we'll catch him up this way. He swung perilously into the main ride and was gone, totally unaware of the position that Miss Sally's quickness had saved. Flurry rode straight up to his cousin with a pale, dangerous face. I suppose you think I'm to stand being ridden over and having my hounds killed to please you he said, but you're mistaken. Oh, you are very smart, and you may think you've saved him his licking, but you needn't think he won't get it. He'll have it in spite of you before he goes to his bed this night. A man who loses his temper badly because he is badly in love is inevitably ridiculous, far though he may be from thinking himself so. He is also a highly unpleasant person to argue with, and Miss Sally and I held our peace respectfully. He turned his horse and rode away. Almost instantly the three couple of hounds opened at the underwood near us with a deafening crash, and not twenty yards ahead the hunted fox, dark with wet and mud, slunk across the ride. The hounds were almost on his brush, Moonlighter reared and chafed. The din was redoubled, passed away to a little distance, and suddenly seemed stationary in the middle of the laurels. Could he have got into the old ice house? exclaimed Miss Sally with reviving excitement. She pushed ahead and turned down the narrowest of all the rides that had that day been my portion. At the end of the green tunnel, there was a comparatively open space. Flurry's mare was standing in it, riderless, and Flurry himself was hammering with a stone at the padlock of a door that seemed to lead into the heart of a laurelled clump. The hounds were baying furiously somewhere back of the entrance among the laurel stems. He's got in by the old ice strain, said Flurry, addressing himself sulkily to me and ignoring Miss Sally. He had not the least idea of how absurd was his scowling face, draped by the luxuriant heart's tongues that overhung the doorway. The padlock yielded, and the opening door revealed a low, dark passage into which Flurry disappeared, lugging a couple of hounds with him by the scruff of the neck. The remaining two couple bayed implacably at the mouth of the drain. The croak of a rusty bolt told of a second door at the inner end of the passage. 
Look out for the steps, Flurry. They're all broken, called out Miss Sally in tones of honey. There was no answer. Miss Sally looked at me. Her face was serious, but her mischievous eyes made a confederate of me. He's in an awful rage, she said. I'm afraid there will certainly be a row. A row there certainly was. But it was in the cavern of the ice house where the fox had evidently been discovered. Miss Sally suddenly flung Moonlighter's reins to me and slipped off his back. Hold him, she said and dived into the doorway under the overhanging branches. Things happened after that, with astonishing simultaneousness. There was a shrill exclamation from Miss Sally. The inner door was slammed and bolted. And at one and the same moment, the fox darted from the entry and was away into the wood before one could wink. What's happened? I called out playing the refractory moonlighter like a salmon. Miss Sally appeared at the doorway, looking half scared and half delighted. I've bolted him in, and I won't let him out till he promises to be good. I was only just in time to slam the door after the fox bolted out. Great Scott, I said helplessly. Miss Sally vanished again into the passage, and the imprisoned hounds continued to express their emotions in the echoing vault of the ice house. Their master remained mute as the dead, and I trembled. Flurry, I heard Miss Sally say. Flurry, I, uh, I've locked you in. This self-evident piece of information met with no response. Shall I tell you why? A keener note seemed to indicate that a hound had been kicked. I don't care whether you answer me or not. I'm going to tell you. There was a pause. Apparently telling him was not as simple as had been expected. I don't let you out till you promise me something. Ah, flurry... Don't be so cross. What do you say? Oh, that's a ridiculous thing to say. You know quite well it's not on his account. There was another considerable pause. Flurry, said Miss Sally again in tones that would have wiled a badger from his earth. Dear Flurry, at this point, I hurriedly flung Moonlatter's bridle over a branch and withdrew. My own subsequent adventures are quite immaterial, until the moment when I encountered Miss Sally on the steps of the hall door at Castle Knox. Ah, I'm just going in to take off these wet things, she said airily. This was no way to treat a confederate. Well, I said, barring her progress. Oh, uh, he, uh, he promised. It's all right, she replied, rather breathlessly. There was no one about. I waited resolutely for further information. It did not come. Did he try to make his own terms, said I looking hard at her. Yes, he did. She tried to pass me. And what did you do? I refused them, she said, with a sudden stagger of a sob in her voice as she escaped into the house. Now what on earth was Sally Knox crying about? Chapter 10 The House of Fahey Nothing could shake the conviction of Maria that she was by nature and by practice a house dog. 
every one of Sri Lane's many doors had, at one time or another, slammed upon her expulsion, and each one of them had seen her stealthy, irrepressible return to the sphere that she felt herself so eminently qualified to grace. For her, the bone, thriftily interred by Tim Connell's terrier, was a mere diversion. Even the fruitage of the ash pit had little charm for an accomplished habitué of the kitchen. She knew to a nasty which of the doors could be burst open by assault, at which it was necessary to whine, sycophantically, and the clinical thermometer alone could furnish a parallel for her perception of mood in those in authority. In the case of Mrs. Cadigan, she knew that there were seasons when instant and complete self-effacement was the only course to pursue. Therefore, when, on a certain morning in July, on my way through the downstairs regions to my office, I saw her approach the kitchen door with her usual circumspection and, on hearing her name enunciated indignantly by my cook, withdraw swiftly to a city of refuge at the back of the hayrick, I drew my own conclusions. Had she remained as I did, she would have heard the disclosure of a crime that lay more heavily on her digestion than her conscience. I can't put a thing out of me hand, but he's watching me to whip it away, declaimed Mrs. Cadogan, with all the disregard of her kind for the accident of sex in the brute creation. Twas only last night I was back in the scullery, when I heard Bridget let a screech, and there was me brave dog up on the table, eating the roast beef that was after coming out from the dinner. Brute, interjected Philippa, with what well I knew to be a simulated wrath. And I had planned that bit of beef for the luncheon, continued Mrs. Cadogan, in impassioned lamentation. The way we wouldn't have to intrude on the cold turkey. Should he has it that dragged, that all we can do with it now is run it through the mincing machine for the major sandwiches. At this appetizing suggestion, I thought fit to intervene in the deliberations. One thing, I said to Philippa afterwards, as I wrapped up a bottle of Yanatas in a cardigan jacket and rammed it into an already apoplectic Gladstone bag, that I do draw the line at is taking that dog with us. The whole business is black enough as it is. Dear, said my wife, looking at me with almost clairvoyant abstraction, I could manage a second evening dress if you didn't mind putting my tea jacket in your portmanteau. Little, thank heaven, as I know about yachting, I knew enough to make pertinent remarks on the incongruity of an ancient sixty-ton hireling and a fleet of smart evening dresses. But nonetheless, I left a pair of indispensable boots behind, and the tea jacket went into my portmanteau. It is doing no more than the barest justice to the officers of the Royal Navy to say that, so far as I know them, they cherish no mistaken enthusiasm for a home on the rolling deep, when a home anywhere else presents itself. Bernard Chute had unfortunately proved an exception to this rule. During the winter, the invitations to go for a cruise and the yacht that was in process of building for him hung over me like a cloud. A timely strike in the builder's yard brought a respite and, in fact, placed the completion of the yacht at so safe a distance that I was betrayed into specious regrets, echoed with an atrocious sincerity by Philippa. Into a life pastorally compounded of petty sessions and lawn tennis parties, retribution fell when it was least expected. Bernard Shute hired a yacht in Queenstown, and one short week afterwards the worst had happened, and we were packing our things for a cruise in her the only alleviation being the knowledge that, whether by sea or land, I was bound to return to my work in four days. We left Sri Lane at twelve o'clock, especially depressing hour for a start, when breakfast has died in you and lunch is still remote. My last act before mounting the dog cart 
was to put her collar and chain on Maria and immure her in the potato house, whence, as we drove down the avenue, her wails rent the heart of Philippa and rejoiced mine. It was a very hot day with a cloudless sky. The dust lay thick on the white road and on us also, as during the two baking hours we drove up and down the long hills and remembered things that had been left behind and grew hungry enough to eat sandwiches that tasted suspiciously of roast beef. The yacht was moored in Tauntis Harbour. We drove through the village street, a narrow and unlovely thoroughfare studded with public houses swarming with children and poultry down through an ever-growing smell of fish to the quay. Thence we first viewed our fate, a dingy-looking schooner and the hope I had secretly been nourishing that there was not wind enough for her to start was dispelled by the sight of her topsail going up. More than ever at that radiant moment as the reflection of the white sail quivered on the tranquil blue and the still water flattered all it reproduced, like a fashionable photographer, did I agree with George Herbert's advice. Praise the sea, but stay on shore. We must hail her, I suppose, I said drearily. I assailed the island og, uh, such being her inappropriate name, with desolate cries, but achieved no immediate result beyond the assembling of some village children round us and our luggage. Mr. Shute and the two ladies was after screeching here for the boat a while ago, volunteered a horrid little girl, whom I had already twice frustrated in the attempt to seat an infant relative on our bundle of rags. Timsey Hallihane says... "'Twould be as good for them to stay ashore, "'for there isn't as much wind outside as it out a candle.' "'With this encouraging statement, "'the little girl devoted herself to the alternate "'consumption of gooseberries and cockles. "'All things come to those who wait, and to us. "'Arrived at length the gig of the Eileen Oag, "'and such by this time were the temperature "'and the smells of the key that I actually welcome the moment that found us leaving it for the yacht. Now, Sinclair, aren't you glad we came? remarked Philippa, as the clear green water deepened under us, and a light briny air came coolly round us with the motion of the boat. As she spoke, there was an outburst of screams from the children on the quay, followed by a heavy splash. Oh, stop! cried Philippa in an agony. One of them has fallen in. I can see its poor little brown head. Tis a dog, ma'am, said briefly the man who was rowing stroke. One might have wished it had been that little girl, said I, as I steered to the best of my ability for the yacht. We had traversed another twenty yards or so when Philippe, in a voice in which horror and triumph were strangely blended, exclaimed, She's following us. Who? The little girl? I asked callously. No, returned Philippa. Worse. I looked round, and not without a prevision of what I was to see, and beheld the faithful Maria swimming steadily after us with her brown muzzle thrust out in front of her, ripping through the reflections like a plough. Go home! I roared, standing up and gesticulating in fury that I well knew to be impotent. Go home, you brute! Maria redoubled her efforts, and Philippa murmured uncontrollably, Well, she is a dear. Had I had a sword in my hand, I should undoubtedly have slain Philippa. But before I could express my sentiments in any way, a violent shock flung me endways on top of the man who was pulling stroke. Thanks to Maria... We had reached our destination all unawares. The two men, respectfully awaiting my instructions, had rowed on with disciplined steadiness, and, as a result, we had rammed the Eileen Oag amidship, with a vigour that brought Mr. Shute tumbling up the companion to see what had happened. Oh, it's you, is it? 
he said with his mouth full. Come in. Don't knock. <laughs> Delighted to see you, Mrs. Yates. Oh, don't apologize. There's nothing like a hired ship after all. <laughs> it's quite jolly to see the splinters fly. <laughs> Shows you're getting our money's worth. <laughs> oh, hello. Who's this? This was Mariah, feigning exhaustion and noisily treading water at the boat's side. What? Poor old Mariah. Wanted to send her ashore, did he? Oh, heartless ruffian. Thus was Mariah installed on board the Eileen Og, and the element of fatality had already begun to work. There was just enough wind to take us out of Tantis Harbour, and with the last of the outrunning tide, we crept away to the west. The party on board consisted of our host sister, Miss Cecilia Shute, Miss Sally Knox, and ourselves. We sat about in conventional attitudes and deck chairs, and on adamantine deck bosses, and I talked to Miss Shute with feverish brilliancy, and wished the patient's cards were not in the cabin. I knew the supreme importance of keeping one's mind occupied, but I dared not face the cabin. There was a long, almost imperceptible swell, with little queer seabirds that I have never seen before, and trust I shall never again, dotted about on its glassy slopes. The coastline looked low and grey and dull, as I think coastlines always do when viewed from the deep. The breeze that Bernard had promised us we should find outside was barely enough to keep us moving. The burning sun of four o'clock focused its heat on the deck. Bernard stood up among us, engaged in what he was pleased to call handling the stick, and beamed almost as offensively as the sun. Oh, we're slipping along, he said, his odiously healthy face glowing like copper against the blazing blue sky. Oh, going a great deal faster than you think. And the men say we'll pick up a breeze once we're round the mizzen. I made no reply. I was not feeling ill, merely thoroughly disinclined for conversation. Miss Sally smiled wanly, and closing her eyes, laid her head on Philippa's knee. Instructed by a dread Freemasonry, I knew that for her the moment had come when she could no longer bear to see the rail rise slowly above the horizon and, with an equal rhythmic slowness, sink below it. Mariah moved restlessly to and fro, panting and yawning, and occasionally rearing herself on her hind legs against the side and staring forth with wide eyes at the headachy sliding of the swell. Perhaps she was meditating suicide. If so, I sympathised with her. And since she was obviously going to be sick, I trusted that she would bring off the suicide with as little delay as possible. Philippa and Miss Shute sat in unaffected serenity in deck chairs and stitched at white things. Tea cloths for the Eileen Og, I believe. Things in themselves a mockery. And talked untiringly with that singular indifference to their marine surroundings that I have often observed in ladies who are not seasick. It always stirs me afresh to wonder why they have not remained ashore. Nevertheless, I prefer their tranquil and total lack of interest in seafaring matters to the blatant Vikingism of the average male who is similarly placed. Somehow, I know not how, we crawled onwards, and by about five o'clock we had rounded the mizzen, a gaunt spike of a head on that starts up like a boar's tusk above the ragged lip of the Irish coast, and the Eileen Og was beginning to swing and wallop in the long sluggish rollers that the American liners know and despise. I was very far from despising them. Down in the west, resting on the sea's rim, a purple bank of clouds lay awaiting the descent of the sun as seductively and as malevolently as a damp bed at a hotel awaits a traveller. The end, so far as I was concerned, came at tea-time. The meal had been prepared in the saloon, 
and thither it became incumbent on me to accompany my hostess and my wife. Miss Sally, long past speech, opened at the suggestion of tea one eye and disclosed a look of horror. As I tottered down the companion, I respected her good sense. The Eileen Oag had been built early in the 60s, and headroom was not her strong point. Neither, apparently, was ventilation. I began by dashing my forehead against the frame of the cabin door, and then, shattered morally and physically, entered into the atmosphere of the pit. After which things, and the sight of a plate of rich cake, I retired in good order to my cabin and began upon the Yanatas. I pass over some painful intermediate details and resume at the moment when Bernard Chute woke me from a drug slumber to announce that dinner was over. Oh, it's been raining pretty hard, he said, swaying easily with the swing of the yacht. But we've got a clinking breeze, and we ought to make Lodica Harbour tonight. There's good anchorage there, the men say. Uh, there are rather a lot of swabs, but they know this coast, and I don't. I took them over with the ship, all standing. Where are we now? I asked. Something heartened by the blessed word anchorage. You're running up Sheepskin Bay. It's a thundering big bay. Lodiger's up at the far end of it, and the night's as black as the inside of a car. Dig out and get something to eat, and come on deck. What? No dinner? I spoke morosely with closed eyes. Oh, rot! You're on an even keel now. I promised Mrs. Yates I'd make you dig out. <laughs> You're as bad as a soldier officer that we were ferrying to Malty one time in the old Tamar. He got one leg out of his berth when we were going down the channel, and he was too sick to pull it in again till we got to jib. <laughs> I compromised on a drink and some biscuits. The ship was certainly steadier, and I felt sufficiently restored to climb weakly on deck. It was by this time past ten o'clock, and heavy clouds blotted out the last of the afterglow and smothered the stars at their birth. A wet, warm wind was lashing the Eileen Og up a wide estuary. The waves were hunting her, hissing under her stern, racing up to her, crested with the white glow of phosphorus as she fled before them. I dimly discerned in the greyness the more solid greyness of the shore. The mainsail loomed out into the darkness, nearly at right angles to the yacht, with the boom creaking as the following wind gave us an additional shove. I know nothing of yacht sailing, but I can appreciate the grand fact that in running before a wind, the boom is removed from its usual sphere of devastation. I sat down beside a bundle of rugs that I had discovered to be my wife, and thought of my whitewashed office at Tree Lane and its bare but stationary floor, with a yearning that was little short of passion. Miss Sally had long since succumbed, Miss Chute was tired, and had turned in soon after dinner. I suppose she's overdone by the delirious gaiety of the afternoon, said I acridly in reply to this information. Philippa cautiously poked her head from the rugs, like a tortoise from under its shell, to see that Bernard, who was standing near the steersman, was out of hearing. In all your life, Sinclair, she said impressively, you never knew such a time as Cecilia and I have had down there. We've had to wash everything in the cabins and remake the beds and hurl the sheets away. They were covered with black finger marks. And while we were doing that, in came the creature that calls himself the steward to ask if he might get something of his that he had left in Miss Chute's birthplace. And he rooted out from under Cecilia's mattress a pair of socks and half a loaf of bread. Consolation to Miss Chute to know her birth has been well aired, I said with the nearest approach to enjoyment I had known since I came on board. And has Sally made any 
equally interesting discoveries. She said she didn't care what her bed was like. She just dropped into it. I must say I am sorry for her, went on Philippa. She hated coming. Her mother made her accept. I wonder if Lady Knox will make her accept him, I said. How often has Sally refused him? Does anyone know? Oh, about once a week, replied Philippa. Just the way I kept on refusing you, you know. Something cold and wet was thrust into my hand, and the aroma of damp dog arose upon the night air. Maria had issued from some lair at the sound of our voices and was now, with palsied tremblings, slowly trying to drag us up onto my lap. Poor thing. She's been so dreadfully ill, said Philippa. Don't send her away, Sinclair. Mr. Shute found her lying on his berth, not able to move. Didn't you, Mr. Shute? She found out that she was able to move, said Bernard, who had crossed to our side of the deck. It was somehow borne in upon her when I got at her with a boot tree. I wouldn't advise you to keep her in your lap, Yates. She stole half a ham after dinner, and she might take a notion to make the only reparation in her power. I stood up and stretched myself stiffly. The wind was freshening, and though the growing smoothness of the water told that we were making shelter of some kind, for all that I could see of land, we might as well have been in mid-ocean. The heaving lift of the deck under my feet and the lurching swing, when a stronger gust filled the ghostly sails, were more disquieting to me in suggestion than in reality, and to my surprise, I found something almost enjoyable in rushing through darkness at the pace at which we were going. We're a small bit short of the mouth of Lorica Harbour yet, sir, said the man who was steering in reply to a question from Bernard. I can see the shore well enough. Shall I know every yard of water in the bay? As he spoke, he sat down abruptly and violently. So did Bernard. So did I. The bundle that contained Philippa collapsed upon Maria. Main sheet, bellowed Bernard, on his feet in an instant, as the boom swung in and out again with a terrific jerk. We're ashore! In response to this order... Three men in succession fell over me while I was still struggling on the deck, and something that was either Philippa's elbow or the acutest angle of Maria's skull hit me in the face. As I found my feet, the cabin skylight was suddenly illuminated by a wavering glare. I got across the slanting deck somehow, through the confusion of shouting men and the flapping thunder of the sails, and saw through the skylight a gush of flame rising from a pool of fire around an overturned lamp on the swing table. I avalanched down the companion and was squandered like an avalanche on the floor at the foot of it. Even as I fell, McCarthy, the steward, dragged the strip of carpet from the cabin floor and threw it on the blaze. I found myself, in some unexplained way, snatching a railway rug from Miss Shute and applying it to the same purpose and in half a dozen seconds we had smothered the flame and were left in total darkness. The most striking feature of the situation was the immovability of the yacht. Great Ned, said McCarthy, invoking I know not what heathen deity, is it on the bottom of the sea we are? Well, whether or no, thank God, we have the fire quenched. We were not so far at the bottom of the sea, but during the next few minutes, the chances seemed in favour of our getting there. The yacht had run her bows upon a sunken ridge of rock, and after a period of feminine indecision as to whether she were going to slide off again or roll over into deep water, she elected to stay where she was, and the gig was lowered with all speed in order to tow her off before the tide left her. My recollection of this interval is but hazy. 
but I can certify that in ten minutes I had swept together an assortment of necessaries and knotted them into my countervane, had broken the string of my eyeglass and lost my silver matchbox, had found Philippa's curling tongs and put them in my pocket, had carted all the luggage on deck, had then applied myself to the manly duty of reassuring the ladies, and had found Miss Shute merely bored. Philippa, enthusiastically anxious to be allowed to help to pull the gig, and Miss Sally, radiantly restored to health and spirits by the cessation of movement and the probability of an early escape from the yacht. The rain had, uh, with its usual opportuneness, begun again. We stood in it under umbrellas and watched the gig jumping on its tow rope like a dog on a string as its crew plied the labouring oar in futile endeavour to move the Eileen Oag. We had run on the rock at half tide and the increasing slant of the deck as the tide fell brought home to us the pleasing probability that at low water, viz. about 2 a.m., we should roll off the rock and go to the bottom. Had Bernard Chute wished to show himself in the most advantageous light to Miss Sally, he could scarcely have bettered the situation. I looked on in helpless respect, while he, whom I had known as the scourge of the hunting field, the terror of the shooting party, rose to the top of a difficult position and kept there. And my respect was, if possible, increased by the presence of mind with which he availed himself of all critical moments to place a protecting arm round Miss Knox. By about 1 a.m., the two gaffs with which Bernard had contrived to shore up the slowly healing yacht began to show signs of yielding, and in approved shipwreck fashion, we took to the boats the yacht's crew and the gig remaining in attendance on what seemed likely to be the last moments of the Eileen Oag, while we and the dinghy sought for the harbour. Owing to the tilt of the yacht's deck and the roughness of the broken water round her, getting into the boat was no mean feat of gymnastics. Miss Sally did it like a bird, alighting in the inevitable arms of Bernard. Miss Shute followed very badly, but by innate force of character, successfully. Philippa, who was enjoying every moment of her shipwreck, came last, launching herself into the dinghy with my silver shoehorn clutched in one hand and in the other the tea basket. I heard the hollow clank of its tin cups as she sprang and appreciated the heroism with which Bernard received one of its corners in his waist. How or when Maria left the yacht I know not. But when I applied myself to the bow oar, I led off with three crabs, owing to the devotion with which she thrust her head into my lap. I am no judge of these matters, but in my opinion, we ought to have been swamped several times during that row. There was nothing but the phosphorus of breaking waves to tell us where the rocks were, and nothing to show where the harbour was except a solitary light, a masthead light, as we supposed. The skipper had assured us that we could not go wrong if we kept a westerly course with a little northing in it. But it seemed simpler to steer for the light, and we did so. The dinghy climbed along over the waves with an agility that was safer than it felt. The rain fell without haste and without rest. The oars were as inflexible as crowbars and somewhat resembled them in shape and weight. Nevertheless, it was Elysium when compared with the afternoon leisure of the deck of the Eileen Oag. At last we came unexplainably into smooth water and it was at about this time that we were first aware that the darkness was less dense than it had been and that the rain had ceased. By imperceptible degrees, a greyness touched the back of the waves, more a dreariness than a dawn, but more welcome than thousands of gold and silver. I looked over my shoulder and discerned vague, bulky things ahead. As I did so, my oar was suddenly wrapped in seaweed. We crept on. 
Maria stood up with her paws on the gunwale and whined in high agitation. The dark objects ahead resolved themselves into rocks and, without much more ado, Maria pitched herself into the water. In half a minute, we heard her shaking herself on shore. We slid on. The water swelled out of the dinghy and lifted her keel onto grating gravel. We couldn't have done it better if we'd been the hydrographer royal, said Bernard, wading knee-deep in a light wash of foam with the painter in his hand. But all the same, that masthead light is someone's bedroom candle. We landed, hauled up the boat, and then feebly sat down on our belongings to review the situation. And Maria came and shook herself over each of us in turn. We had run into a little cove. Guided by the philanthropic beam of a candle in the upper window of a house about a hundred yards away, the candle still burned on, and an anemic daylight exhibited to us our surroundings, and we debated as to whether we could at 2.45 a.m. present ourselves as objects of compassion to the owner of the candle. I need hardly say that it was the ladies who decided on making the attempt, having, like most of their sex, a courage incomparably superior to ours in such matters. Bernard and I had not a grain of genuine compunction in our souls, but we failed in nerve. We trailed up from the cove laden with immigrants' bundles, stumbling on wet rocks in the half-light and succeeded in making our way to the house. It was a small two-storied building of that hideous breed of architecture, usually dedicated to the rectories of the Irish church. We felt that there was something friendly in the presence of a pair of carpet slippers in the porch, but there was a hint of exclusiveness in the fact that there was no knocker and that the bell was broken. The light still burned in the upper window, and with a faltering hand I flung gravel at the glass. This summons was appallingly responded to by a shriek. There was a flutter of white at the panes, and the candle was extinguished. Come away, exclaimed Miss Shute. It's a lunatic asylum. We stood our ground, however, and presently heard a footstep within. A blind was poked aside in another window, and we were inspected by an unseen inmate. Then someone came downstairs, and the hall door was opened by a small man with a bald head and a long sandy beard. He was attired in a brief dressing gown, and on his shoulder sat, uh, like an angry ghost, a large white cockatoo. Its crest was up on end. Its beak was a good two inches long and curved like a Malay chris. Its claws gripped the little man's shoulder. Maria uttered in the background a low and thunderous growl. Don't take any notice of the bird, please, said the little man nervously, seeing our united gaze fixed upon this apparition. He's extremely fierce, if annoyed. The majority of our party here melted away to either side of the hall door, and I was left to do the explaining. The tale of our misfortunes had its due effect, and we were ushered into a small drawing room, our host holding open the door for us, like a nightmare footman with bare shins, a gnome-like bald head, and an unclean spirit swaying on his shoulder. He opened the shutters, and we sat decorously round the room as at an afternoon party, while the situation was further expounded on both sides. Our entertainer, indeed, favoured us with the leading items of his family history, amongst them the facts that he was a Dr. Fahey from Cork, who had taken somebody's rectory for the summer and had been prevailed on by some of his patients to permit them to join him as paying guests. 
I said it was a lunatic asylum, murmured Miss Shoot to me. In point of fact, went on our host, there isn't an empty room in the house, which is why I can only offer your party the use of this room and the kitchen fire, which I make a point of keeping burning all night. He leaned back complacently in his chair and crossed his legs. Then, obviously remembering his costume, sat bolt upright again. We owed the guiding beams of the candle to the owner of the cockatoo, an old Mrs. Buck, who was, we gathered, the most paying of all the patients, and also, obviously, the one most feared and cherished by Dr. Fahey. She has a candle burning all night for the bird, and her door open uh, to let him uh, walk about the house when he likes, said Dr. Fahey. Indeed, I may say, her passion for him amounts to dementia. He is very fond of me, and Mrs. Fahey is always telling me I should be thankful, as whatever he did, we'd be bound to put up with it. Dr. Fahey had evidently a turn for conversation that was unaffected by circumstance. The first beams of the early sun were lighting up the rep chair covers before the door closed upon his brown dressing gown and upon the stately white back of the cockatoo and the demoniac possession of laughter that had wrought in us during the interview burst forth unchecked. It was most painful and exhausting, as much laughter always is, and by far the most serious part of it was that Miss Sally, who was sitting in the window, somehow drove her elbow through a pane of glass, and Bernard, in pulling down the blind to conceal the damage, tore it off the roller. There followed on this catastrophe a period during which reason tottered, and Maria barked furiously. Philippa was the first to pull herself together, and to suggest an adjournment to the kitchen fire that, in honour of the paying guests, was never quenched, and, respecting the repose of the household, we proceeded thither with a stealth that convinced Maria we were engaged in a rat hunt. The boots of paying guests littered the floor, the debris of the last repast covered the table. A cat in some unseen fastness crooned a war song to Maria, who feigned unconsciousness and fell to scientific research in the scullery. We roasted our boots at the range, and Bernard, with all a sailor's gift for exploration and theft, prowled in noisome purlieus and emerged with a jug of milk and a lump of salt butter. No one who has not been a burglar can at all realise what it was to roam through Dr. Fahey's basement story with the rookery of paying guests asleep above, and to feel that, so far, we had repaid his confidence by breaking a pane of glass and a blind and putting the scullery tap out of order. I have always maintained that there was something wrong with it before I touched it, but the fact remains that when I had filled Philippus' kettle, no human power could prevail upon it to stop flowing. For all I know, to the contrary, it is running still. It was in the course of our furtive return to the drawing room that we were again confronted by Mrs. Buck's cockatoo. It was standing in malign meditation on the stairs, and on seeing us, it rose, without a word of warning upon the wing, and with a long screech flung itself at Miss Sally's golden-red head, which a ray of sunlight had chanced to illumine. There was a moment of stampede as the selected victim, pursued by the cockatoo, fled into the drawing-room. Two chairs were upset, one, I think, broken. Miss Sally enveloped herself in a window curtain. Philippa and Miss Shute effaced themselves beneath the table. The cockatoo, foiled of its prey, skimmed, still screeching, round the ceiling. It was Bernard who, with a well-directed sofa cushion, drove the enemy from the room. There was only a chink of the door open, but the cockatoo turned on his side as he flew and swung through it like a woodcock. We slammed the door behind him, and at the same instant there came a thumping on the floor overhead, muffled yet 
peremptory. That's Mrs. Buck, said Miss Shute, crawling from under the table. The room over this is the one that had the candle in it. We sat for a time in awful stillness, but nothing further happened, save a distant shriek overhead that told the cockatoo had sought and found sanctuary in his owner's room. We had tea, sotto voce, and then, one by one, despite the amazing discomfort of the drawing-room chairs, we dozed off to sleep. It was at about five o'clock that I woke with a stiff neck and an uneasy remembrance that I had last seen Maria in the kitchen. The others, looking each of them, about twenty years older than their age, slept in various attitudes of exhaustion. Bernard opened his eyes as I stole forth to look for Maria, but none of the ladies awoke. I went down the evil-smelling passage that led to the kitchen stairs, and there, on a mat, Regarding me with intelligent affection was Maria. But what? Oh, what was the white thing that lay between her forepaws? The situation was too serious to be coped with alone. I fled noiselessly back to the drawing room and put my head in. Bernard's eyes... Blessed be the light sleep of sailors, opened again. And there was that in mine that summoned him forth. Blessed also be the light step of sailors. We took the corpse from Maria, withholding perforce the language and the slaughtering that our hearts ached to bestow. For a minute or two our eyes communed. I'll get the kitchen shovel breathed Bernard. You open the whole door. A moment later, we passed like spirits into the open air and on into a little garden at the end of the house. Maria followed us, licking her lips. There were beds of nasturtiums and of purple stocks and of marigolds. We chose a bed of stocks, a plump bed that looked like easy digging. The windows are all tightly shut and shuttered, and I took the cockatoo from under my coat and hid it, temporarily, behind a box border. Bernard had brought a shovel and a coal scoop. We dug like badgers. At eighteen inches, we got down into shale and stones, and the coal scoop struck work. Never mind, said Bernard. We'll plant the stocks on top of him. It was a lovely morning, with a newborn blue sky and a light northerly breeze. As we returned to the house, we looked across the waveless of the little cove and saw, above the rocky point, round which we had groped last night, a triangular white patch moving slowly along. Tides lift at her, said Bernard, standing stock still. He looked at Mrs. Buck's window and at me. Yates, he whispered, let's quit. It was now barely six o'clock, and not a soul was stirring. We woke the ladies and convinced them of the high importance of catching the tide. Bernard left a note on the hall table for Dr. Fahey, a beautiful note of leave-taking and gratitude, and apology for the broken window, for which he begged to enclose half a crown. No allusion was made to the other casualties. As we neared the strand, he found an occasion to say to me, I put in a postscript, but I thought it best to mention that I had seen the cockatoo in the garden and hoped it would get back all right. Uh, that's quite true, you know. But look here. Whatever you do, you must keep it all dark from the ladies. At this juncture, 
Maria overtook us with a cockatoo in her mouth. Chapter 11 Occasional Licenses It's out of the question, I said, looking forbiddingly at Mrs. Maloney through the spokes of the bicycle that I was pumping up outside the grocer's in Skibon. Well, indeed, Major Yates, said Mrs. Maloney, advancing excitedly and placing on the nickel plating a hand that I had good and recent calls to know was warm. Sure, I know well that if the angel Gabriel came down from heaven looking for a license for the races, your honour would give it to him without a character. But as for Michael, sure, sure the world knows what Michael is. I had been waiting for Philippa for already nearly half an hour, and my temper was not at its best. Character or no character, Mrs. Maloney, said I with asperity. The magistrates have settled to give no occasional licenses. And if Michael were as sober as... Is it sober? God help us! exclaimed Mrs. Maloney, with an upward rolling of her eye to the recording angel. I'll tell your honour the truth. I'm his wife now fifteen years. And I never seen the sign of drink on Michael only once. And that was when... He went out of good nature, helping Timsey Ryan to whitewash his house, and Timsey and himself had a couple of pots of porter, and look, he was as little used to it that his head got light. And he walked away out to drive in the cows, and eat no more than eleven o'clock in the day. And the cows, the creatures, as much surprised, going hithering over the four corners of the road from him. Faith, <laughs> you'd have to laugh. Michael says I to him, you're drunk. I am, says he, and the tears rain from his eyes. I turn the cows from him. Go home, I says, and lie down on Willie Tom's bed. At this affecting point, my wife came out of the grocer's with a large parcel to be strapped to my handlebar. And the history of Mr. Maloney's solitary lapse from sobriety got no further than Willie Tom's bed. You see, I said to Philippa, as we bicycled quietly home through the hot June afternoon, we settled. We'll give no licenses for the sports. Why, even young she, who owns three pubs in Skibon, came to me and said he hoped the magistrates would be firm about it, as these one-day licenses were quite unnecessary and only led to drunkenness and fighting, and every man on the bench has joined in promising not to grant any. How nice, dear, said Philippa, absently. Do you know Mrs. MacDonald can only let me have three dozen cups and saucers? I wonder if that will be enough. Do you mean to say you expect three dozen people, said I? Oh, it's always well to be prepared, replied my wife evasively. During the next few days, I realized the true inwardness of what it was to be prepared for an entertainment of this kind. Games were not at a high level in my district. Football, of a wild gorilla species, was waged intermittently, blended in some inextricable way with home rule and a brass band, and on Sundays, gatherings of young men rolled a heavy round stone along the roads, a rudimentary form of sport, whose fascination lay primarily in the fact that it was illegal, and, in lesser degree, in betting on the length of each roll. I had had a period of enthusiasm during which I thought I was going to be the apostle of cricket in the neighbourhood, but my mission dwindled to single wicket with Peter Cadogan, who was indulgent but bored. And I swiped the ball through the dining room window, and someone took one of the stumps to poke the laundry fire. 
Once a year, however, on that festival of the Roman Catholic Church, which is familiarly known as Peter and Paul's Day, the district was wont to make a spasmodic effort at athletic sports, which were duly patronised by the gentry and promoted by the publicans. And this year, the honour of a steward's green rosette was conferred upon me. Philippa's genius for hospitality here saw its chance and broke forth into unbridled tea party in connection with the sports, even involving me in the hire of a tent, the conveyance of chairs and tables, and other large operations. It chanced that Flurry Knox, on this occasion, lent the fields for the sports, with the proviso that horse races and a tug award were to be added to the usual programme. Flurry's participation in events of this kind seldom failed to be of an inflaming character. As he and I planted large spars for the high jump and stuck furze bushes into hurdles, locally known as hurls, and skirmished hourly with people who wanted to sell drink on the course, I thought that my next summer leave would singularly coincide with the festival consecrated to St. Peter and St. Paul. We made a grandstand of quite four feet high, out of old fish boxes, which smelt worse and worse as the day wore on, but was nonetheless as sought after by those for whom it was not intended as is the royal enclosure at Ascot. We broke gaps in all the fences to allow carriages on to the ground. We armed a gang of the worst blaggers in Scabon with cart whips to keep the course, and felt that organisation could go no further. The momentous day of Peter and Paul opened badly, with heavy clouds and every indication of rain. But after a few thunder showers, things brightened, and it seemed within the bounds of possibility that the weather might hold up. When I got down to the course on the day of the sports, the first thing I saw was a tent of that peculiar filthy grey that usually enshrines the sale of porter, with an array of barrels and a crate beside it. I bore down upon it, in all the indignant majesty of the law, and in so doing came upon Flurry Knox, who was engaged in flogging boys off the grandstand. She he's gone one better than yet, he said, without taking any trouble to conceal the fact that he was amused. She he, I said. Why, she he was the man who went to every magistrate in the country to ask them to refuse a license for the sports. Yes, he took some trouble uh, to prevent anyone else having a look in, replied Floy. He asked every magistrate but one, and that was the one that gave him the license. You don't mean to say that it was you, I demanded in high wrath and suspicion, remembering that she he bred horses and that my friend Mr. Knox was a person of infinite resource in the matter of a deal. Well, well, said Flory, rearranging a disordered fish box. And me, that's a church warden, and sprained me ankle a month ago with running downstairs at my grandmother's to be in time for prayers. Ah, oh, where's the use of a good character in this country? Not much. When you keep it eating its head off for want of exercise, I retorted. But if it wasn't you, who? was it? Uh, do you remember old Moriarty out at Castle Ire? I remembered him extremely well as one of those representatives of the people with whom a paternal government had leavened the effete ranks of the Irish magistracy. Well, resumed Flurry, that license uh, was as good as a five-pound note in his pocket. I permitted myself a comment on Mr. Moriarty, suitable to the occasion. Ah, that's nothing, said Furry easily. He told me one day, when he was half screwed, that his commission of the peace was worth a hundred and fifty a year to him in turkeys and whiskey, and he was telling the truth for once. At this point, Flurry's eye wandered, and following its direction, I saw Lady Knox's smart bus, cleaving its way through the throngs of country people, lurching over the ups and downs of the field like a ship in a sea. I was too blind to make out the component parts of the white froth, 
that crowned it on top and seethed forth from it when it had taken up a position near the tent in which Philippa was even now propping the legs of the tea table. But from the fact that Furry addressed himself to the door, I argued that Miss Sally had gone inside. Lady Knox's manner had something more than its usual bleakness. She had brought, as she promised, a large contingent, but from the way that the strangers within her gates melted impalpably and left me to deal with her single-handed, I drew the further deduction that all was not well. Did you ever in your life see such a gang of women as I have brought with me? She began with her wonted directness as I piloted her to the grandstand and placed her on the stoutest looking of the fish boxes. I have no patience with men who yacht. Bernard Shute has gone off to the Clyde, and I had counted on his being a man at my dance next week. I suppose you'll tell me you're going away too. I assured Lady Knox that I would be a man to the best of my ability. This is the last dance I shall give went on her ladyship, unappeased. The men in this country consist of children and cads. I admitted that we were but a poor lot. But, I said, Miss Sally told me, Sally's a fool, said Lady Knox, with a falcon eye at her daughter, who happened to be talking to her distant kinsman, Mr. Flurry, of that ilk. The races had by this time begun, with a competition known as Hop, Step and Lep. This, judging by the yells, was a highly interesting display, but as it was conducted between two impervious rows of onlookers, the aristocracy on the fish boxes saw nothing save the occasional purple face of a competitor starting into view above the wall of backs like a jack-in-the-box. For me, however... The odorous sanctuary of the fish boxes was not to be. I left it guarded by slipper with a cart whip of flail like dimensions, as disreputable an object as could be seen out of low comedy, with someone's old white cords on his bandy legs, butcher boots, three sizes too big for him, and a black eye. The small boys fled before him. In the glory of his office, he would have flailed his own mother off the fish boxes, had occasion served. I had an afternoon of decidedly mixed enjoyment. My stewardship blossomed forth like Aaron's rod and added to itself the duties of starter, handicapper, general referee, and chucker out, besides which I from time to time strove with emissaries who came from Philippa with messages about water and kettles. Flurry and I had to deal single-handed with the foot races, our brothers in office being otherwise engaged at Mr. Shee's, a task of many difficulties, chiefest being that the spectators all swept forward at the word go and ran the race with the competitors, yelling curses, blessings and advice upon them, taking shortcuts over anything and everybody and mingling inextricably with the finish. By fervent applications of the whips, the course was to some extent purged for the quarter mile, and it would, I believe, have been a triumph of handicapping had not an unforeseen disaster overtaken the favourite. Old Mrs. Knox's bath chair boy. Whether, as was alleged, his braces had or had not been tampered with by a rival was a matter that the referee had subsequently to deal with in the thick of a free fight. But the painful fact remained that in the course of the first lap, what were described as his gallusses abruptly severed their connection with the garments for whose safety they were responsible, and the favourite was obliged to seek seclusion in the crowd. The tug-of-war followed close on this contretemps, and had an excellent effect of drawing away like a blister the inflammation set up by the grievances of the bachelor boy. I cannot at this moment 
remember of how many men each team consisted. My sole aim was to keep the numbers even and to baffle the volunteers who, in an ecstasy of sympathy, attached themselves to the tail of the rope at moments when their champions weakened. The rival forces dug their heels in and tugged. In an uproar that drew forth the innermost line of customers from Mr. Sheehy's porter tent and even attracted the quality from the haven of the fish boxes, Slipper, in the capacity of squire of dames, pioneering Lady Knox through the crowd with the cart whip and with language whose nature was providentially veiled, for the most part, by the din. The tug of war continued unabated. One team was getting the worst of it, but hung doggedly on, sinking lower and lower, till they gradually uh, sat down. Nothing, short of the trump of judgment, could have conveyed to them that they were breaking rules, and both teams settled down by slow degrees onto their sides, with the rope under them and their heels still planted in the ground, bringing about complete deadlock. I do not know the record duration for a tug of war, but I can certify that the Colonna and Nokrani teams lay on the ground at full tension for half an hour, like men in apoplectic fits, each man with his respective adherents howling over him, blessing him and adjuring him to continue. With my own nauseated eyes, I saw a bearded countryman obviously one of Mr. Sheehy's best customers, fling himself on his knees beside one of the combatants and kiss his crimson and streaming face in a rapture of encouragement. As he shoved unsteadily past me on his return journey to Mr. Sheehy's, I heard him informing a friend that he cried a handful over Danny Malloy when he seen the poor brave boy so stubborn and indeed he couldn't say why he cried. For good nature, ye'd cry, suggested the friend. Well, just that, I suppose, returned Danny Malloy's admirer resignedly. Indeed, if it was only two cocks ye seen fighting on the road, your heart would take part with one of them. I had begun to realize that I might as well abandon the tug of war and occupy myself elsewhere when my wife's much-harassed messenger brought me the portentous tidings that Mrs. Yates wanted me at the tent at once. When I arrived, I found the tent literally bulging with Philippa's guests. Lady Knox, seated on a hamper, was taking off her gloves and loudly announcing her desire for tea, and Philippa, with a flushed face and a crooked hat, breathed into my ear the awful news that both the cream and the milk had been forgotten. But Flurry Knox says he can get me some, she went on. He's gone to send people to milk a cow that lives near here. Uh, go out and see if he's coming. I went out and found, in the first instance, Mrs. Cadogan, who greeted me with the prayer that the devil might roast Julia McCarthy that legged it away to the races like a wild goose and left the cream after her on the servants' hall table. Sure, Mr. Furry's gone looking for a cow, and what cow would there be in a backwards place like this? And look at me, striving to keep the kettle simpering on the fire, and not as much as coals under it as it red in the pipe. Where's Mr. Knox? I asked. Himself and slippers galloping the country like the deer, I believe it's to the house above. They went, sir. I followed up a rocky hill to the house above, and there found Flurry and Slipper engaged in the patriarchal task of driving two brace of coupled and spancelled goats into a shed. It's the best we can do, said Flurry briefly. There isn't a cow to be found, and the people are all down at the sports. Be damned to you, Slipper. Don't let them go from you, as the goats charged and doubled like football players. But goat's milk, I said, paralyzed by horrible memories of what tea used to taste like a jib. They'll never know it, 
said Furry, cornering a venerable nanny. Here, hold this divil, and hold her tight. I have no time to dwell upon the pastoral scene that followed. Suffice it to say that at the end of ten minutes of scorching profanity from Tripper and incessant warfare with the goats, the latter had reluctantly yielded two small jugfuls, and the dairymaids had exhibited a nerve and skill in their trade that won my lasting respect. I knew I could trust you, Mr. Knox, said Philippa with shining eyes as we presented her with two foaming beakers. I suppose... A man is never a hero to his wife. But if she could have realized the bruises on my legs, I think she would have reserved a blessing for me also. What was thought of the goat's milk? I gathered symptomatically from a certain fixity of expression that accompanied the first sip of the tea and from observing that comparatively few ventured on second cups. I also noted that after a brief conversation with Flurry, Miss Sally poured her secretly onto the grass. Lady Knox had, throughout the day, preserved an aspect so threatening that no change was perceptible in her demeanour. In the throng of hungry guests, I did not for some time notice that Mr. Knox had withdrawn until something in Miss Sally's eye summoned me to her, and she told me she had a message from him for me. Couldn't we come outside? She said. Outside the tent, within less than six yards of her mother, Miss Sally confided to me a scheme that made my hair stand on end. Summarized, it amounted to this, that first... She was in the primary stage of a deal with Sheehy for a four-year-old chestnut colt for which Sheehy was asking double its value on the assumption that it had no rival in the country. That secondly, they had just heard it was going to run in the first race, and thirdly and lastly, that, as there was no other horse available, Flurry was going to take old Sultan out of the bus and ride him in the race, and that Mrs. Yates had promised to keep Mama safe in the tent while the race was going on. And, you know, Major Yates, it would be delightful to beat Sheehy after his getting the better of you all about the license. With this base appeal to my professional feelings, Miss Knox paused and looked at me insinuatingly. Her eyes were greeny-gray and very beguiling. Come on, she said. They want you to start them. Pursued by visions of the just wrath of Lady Knox, I weakly followed Miss Sally to the farther end of the second field, from which point the race was to start. The course was not a serious one. Two or three natural banks, a stone wall, and a couple of hurls. There were but four riders, including Flurry, who was seated composedly on Sultan, smoking a cigarette and talking confidentially to Slipper. Sultan, although something stricken in years and touched in the wind, was a brown horse who in his day had been a hunter of no mean repute. Even now, he occasionally carried Lady Knox in a sedate and gentlemanly manner, but it struck me that it was trying him rather high to take him from the pole of the bus after twelve miles on a hilly road and hustle him over a country against a four-year-old. My acutest anxiety, however, was to start the race as quickly as possible and to get back to the tent in time to establish an alibi. Therefore... I repressed my private sentiments and, tying my handkerchief to a stick, determined that no time should be fashionably frittered away in false starts. They got away somehow. I believe Sheehy's coat was facing the wrong way at the moment when I dropped the flag, but a friend turned him with the stick and, with a cordial and timely whack, speeded him on his way on sufficiently level terms, and then somehow... 
Instead of returning to the tent, I found myself with Miss Sally on the top of a tall, narrow bank in a precarious line of spectators, with whom we toppled and swayed and, in moments of acuter emotion, held on to each other in unaffected comradeship. Flurry started well, and from our commanding position, we could see him methodically riding at the first fence at a smart hunting canter, closely attended by James Canty's brother and a young black mare, and by an unknown youth on a big white horse. The hope of Sheehy's stable, a leggy chestnut, ridden by a cadet of the house of Sheehy, went away from the friend's stick like a rocket and had already refused his first bank twice before old Sultan decorously changed feet on it and dropped down into the next field with tranquil precision. The white horse scrambled over it on his stomach but landed safely, despite the fact that his rider clasped him round the neck during the process. The black mare and the chestnut shouldered one another over at the hole the white horse had left and the whole party went away in a bunch and jumped the ensuing hurdle without disaster. Flurry continued to ride at the same steady hunting pace, accompanied respectfully by the white horse and by Jerry Canty on the black mare. Sheehy's colt had clearly the legs of the party and did some showy galloping between the jumps. But as he refused to face the banks without a lead, the end of the first round found the field still a social party personally conducted by Mr. Knox. "'That's a damn nice horse,' said one of my hangers-on, looking approvingly at Sultan as he passed us at the beginning of the second round, making a good deal of noise but apparently going at his ease. "'Ye might depend your life on him, and he have the cravatest jock in the globe of Ireland on him this minute. Can't his mare's very sour?' said another. Look at her now, balk on the bank. Hey, she's as cross as a bag of weasels. Uh, Begob, I wouldn't say, but she's a little sign lame, resumed the first. She was going light on one leg on the road a while ago. I tell you what it is, said Miss Sally very seriously in my ear. That chestnut of she's is settling down. I'm afraid he'll gallop away from Sultan at the finish, and the wall won't stop him. Flurry can't get another inch out of Sultan. He's riding him well. She ended in a critical voice, which yet was not quite like her own. Perhaps I should not have noticed it, but for the fact that the hand that held my arm was trembling. As for me, I thought of Lady Knox and trembled too. There now remained but one bank, the trampled remnant of the firs hurdle and the stone wall. The pace was beginning to improve, and the other horses drew away from Sultan. They charged the bank at full gallop, the black mare and the chestnut, flying it perilously with the windmill flourish of legs and arms from their riders. The white horse racing up to it with a gallantry that deserted him at the critical moment with the result that his rider turned a somersault over his head and landed amidst the roars of the onlookers, sitting on the fence, facing his horse's nose. With creditable presence of mind, he remained on the bank, towed the horse over, scrambled onto his back again and started afresh. Sultan, thirty yards to the bad, pounded doggedly on, and Flurry's cane and heels remained idle. The old horse, obviously blown, slowed cautiously, coming in at the jump. Sally's grip tightened on my arm, and the crowd yelled as Sultan, answering to a hint from the spurs and a touch at his mouth, heaved himself onto the bank. Nothing but sheer riding on Flurry's part got him safe off it, and saved him from the consequence of a bad peck on landing. Nonetheless, he pulled himself together and went away down the hill for the stone wall as stoutly as ever. The high road skirted the last two fields, and there was a gate in the roadside fence beside the place where the stone wall met it at right angles. I had noticed this gate because, 
During the first round, Slipper had been sitting on it, demonstrating with his usual fervour. Sheehy's colt was leading, with his nose in the air, his rider's hands going like a circular saw, and his temper, as a bystander remarked, up on end. The black mare, half mad from spurring, was going hard at his heels, completely out of hand. The white horse was steering steadily for the wrong side of the flag, and Flurry, by dint of cutting corners and of saving every yard of ground, was close enough to keep his antagonist's heads over their shoulders, while their right arms rose and fell in unceasing flagellation. There'll be a smash when they come to the wall. If one falls, they'll all go, panted Sally. Oh, now, Flurry, Flurry! What had happened was that the chestnut coat had suddenly perceived that the gate at right angles to the wall was standing wide open and, swinging away from the jump, he had bolted headlong out onto the road and along it at top speed for his home. After him fled Canty's black mare and with her, carried away by the spirit of Stampede, went the white horse. Flurry stood up in his stirrups and gave a view holloa as he cantered down to the wall. Sultan came at it with the send of the hill behind him and jumped it with a skill that intensified, if that were possible, the volume of laughter and yells around us. By the time the black mare and the white horse had returned and ignominiously bundled over the wall to finish as best they might, Flurry was leading Sultan towards us. That blackguard slipper, he said, grinning, Everyone will say I told him to open the gate, but look here. I'm afraid we're in for trouble. Sultan's given himself a bad overreach. You could never drive him home tonight. And I've just seen Norris lying blind drunk under a wall. Now, Norris was Lady Knox's coachman. We stood aghast at this horror on horror's head. The blood trickled down Sultan's heel, and the lava lay in flecks on his dripping, heaving sides, in a refutable witness to the iniquity of Lady Knox's only daughter. Then Flory said, Thank the Lord, here's the rain. At the moment I admit that I fail to see any cause for gratitude in this occurrence, but later on I appreciated Flory's grasp of circumstances. That appreciation was, I think, at its highest development about half an hour afterwards when I, an unwilling conspirator, a part with which my acquaintance with Mr. Knox had rendered me but too familiar, unfurled Mrs. Cadogan's umbrella over Lady Knox's head and hurried her through the rain from the tent to the bus, keeping it and my own person well between her and the horses. I got her in with the rest of the bedraggled and exhausted party and slammed the door. Remember, Major Yates, she said through the window, you are the only person here in whom I have any confidence. I don't wish anyone else to touch the reins. This with a glance towards Flurry, who was standing near. I'm afraid I'm only... A moderate whip, I said. My dear man, replied Lady Knox testily, those horses could drive themselves. I sunk round to the front of the bus. Two horses, carefully rugged, were in it, with the inevitable slipper at their heads. Slipper's going with you, whispered Furry, stepping up to me. She won't have me at any price. He'd throw the rugs over them when you get to the house. And if you hold the umbrella well over her, she'll never see. I'll manage to get Sultan over somehow when Norris is sober. That will be all right. I timed to the box without answering, my soul being bitter within me, as is the soul of a man who had been persuaded by womankind against his judgment. Never again.
I said to myself, picking up the reins, let her marry him, or Bernard shoot, or both of them if she likes, but I won't be roped into this kind of business again. Slipper drew the rugs from the horses, revealing on the near side Lady Knox's majestic carriage horse, and on the off, a thick-set brown mare of about fifteen hands. What brute is this? said I to Slipper, as he swarmed up beside me. I, I don't rightly know where Mr. Flurry got her, said Slipper, with one of his hiccoughing crows of laughter. Give her the whip, Major, and here he broke into song. Howl to the steel, Anna Medjowl, she'll run off like an eel. If you don't shut your mouth, said I with pent-up ferocity, I'll chuck you off the bus. Slipper was but slightly drunk, and uh, taking this delicate rebuke in good part, he relapsed into silence. Wherever the brown mare came from, I can certify it was not out of double harness. Though humble and anxious to oblige, she pulled away from the pole as if it were red hot, and at critical moments had a tendency to sit down. However, we squeezed without misadventure among the donkey carts and between the groups of people, and bumped at length in safety out onto the high road. Here, I thought it no harm to take Slipper's advice, and I applied the whip to the brown mare, who seemed inclined to turn round. She immediately fell into an uncertain canter that no effort of mine could frustrate. I could only hope that Miss Sally would foster conversation inside the bus and create a distraction, but judging from my last view of the party, and of Lady Knox in particular, I thought she was not likely to be successful. Fortunately, the rain was heavy and thick, and a rising west wind gave every promise of its continuance. I had little doubt but that I should catch cold, but I took it to my bosom with gratitude as I reflected how it was drumming on the roof of the bus and blurring the windows. We had reached the foot of a hill, about a quarter of a mile from the racecourse. The Castlenox horse addressed himself to it with dignified determination, but the mare showed a sudden and alarming tendency to jib. Belter, Major, vociferated Slipper, as she hung back from the pole chain with the collar halfway up her ewe neck. And give it to the horse, too. He'll drag her. I was in the act of belting when a squealing whinny struck upon my ear, accompanied by a light pattering gallop on the road behind us. There was an answering roar from the brown mare, a roar, as I realized with a sudden drop of the heart, of outraged maternal feeling, and in another instant a pale yellow foal sprinted up beside us with shrill wickerings of joy. Had there at this moment been a bog hole handy, I should have turned the bus into it without hesitation. As there was no accommodation of the kind, I laid the whip severely into everything I could reach, including the foal. The result was that we topped the hill at a gallop three abreast, like a Russian troika. It was, like my usual luck, that at this identical moment we should meet the police patrol, who saluted respectfully. That the devil may blister Michael Maloney, ejaculated Slipper, holding onto the rail. Didn't I give him the foleen and the halter on him to keep him? I howl you a point. Twas the wife let him go, for she being vexed about the license. Should that one's a march foal, and he'd run from here to Cork. There was no sign from my inside passengers, and I held on at a round pace. The mother and child galloping absurdly, the carriage horse pulling hard but behaving like a gentleman. I wildly revolved plans of how I would make Slipper turn the foal in at the first gate we came to, of what I should say to Lady Knox, supposing the worst happened and the foal accompanied us to her hall door, and of how I would have Flurry's blood at the earliest possible opportunity. And here, 
the fateful sound of galloping behind us was again heard. It's impossible, I said to myself. She can't have twins. The galloping came nearer, and Slipper looked back. Murder alive, he said in a stage whisper. Tom Sheehy's after us, and the butcher's pony. What's that to me, I said, dragging my team aside to let him pass. I suppose he's drunk, like everyone else. Then the voice of Tom Sheehy made itself heard. Stop! Stop, thief! He was bawling. Give up my mare! How will I get me porter home? That was the closest shave I have ever had. And nothing could have saved the position but the torrential nature of the rain and the fact that Lady Knox had on a new bonnet. I explained to her at the door of the bus that she he was drunk, which was the one unassailable feature of the case, and had come after his foal, which, with the fatuity of its kind, had escaped from a field and followed us. I did not mention to Lady Knox that when Mr. Sheehy retreated, apologetically dragging the foal after him in a halter uh, belonging to one of her own carriage horses, he had a sovereign of mine in his pocket, and during the narration I avoided Miss Sally's eye as carefully as she avoided mine. The only comments on the day's events that are worthy of record were that Philippa said to me that she had not been able to understand what the curious taste in the tea had been till Sally told her it was turf smoke, and that Mrs. Cadogan said to Philippa that night that the Major was that drenched that if he had a shirt between his skin and himself, he could have wrung it. And that Lady Knox said to a mutual friend, that though Major Yates had been extremely kind and obliging, he was an uncommonly bad whip. Chapter 12 O Love, O Fire It was on one of the hottest days of a hot August that I walked over to Tory Lodge to inform Mr. Flurry Knox, M.F.H., that the limits of human endurance had been reached and that either Venus and her family, or I and mine, must quit Sri Lane. In a moment of impulse, I had accepted her and her numerous progeny as guests in my stable yard, since when Mrs. Cadogan had given warning once or twice a week, and Maria, lawful autocrat of the ash pit, had had, I quote the kitchen maid, ten battles for every meal she'd ate. The walk over the hills was not of a nature to lower the temperature, moral or otherwise. The grassy path was as slippery as glass. The rocks radiated heat. The bracken radiated horseflies. There was no need to nurse my wrath to keep it warm. I found Flurry seated in the kennel yard in a long and unclean white linen coat, engaged in clipping hieroglyphics on the ears of a young outgoing draft. An occupation in itself unfavourable to argument. The young draft had already monopolised all possible forms of remonstrance, from snarling in the obscurity behind the meal sack in the boiler house, to hysterical yelling as they were dragged forth by the tail. But through these alarms and excursions, I denounced Venus and all her works from slaughtered wire dots to broken dishes. Even as I did so, I was conscious of something chastened in Mr. Knox's demeanour, some touch of remoteness and melancholy with which I was quite unfamiliar. My indictment weakened, and my grievances became trivial when laid before this grave and almost religiously gentle young man. I'm sorry, 
you and Mrs. Yates uh, should be vexed by her. Send her back when you like. Uh, I'll keep her. Maybe it'll not be for so long after all. When pressed to expand this dark saying, Flurry smiled wanly and snipped a second line on the hair of the puppy that was pinned between his legs. I was almost relieved. When a hard try to bite on the part of the puppy imparted to Flurry's language a transient warmth, but the reaction was only temporary. It would be as good for me to make a present of this lot to old Welby as to take the price he's offering me, he went on, as he got up and took off his highly scented kennel coat. But I couldn't be bothered fighting him. Come on in and have something. I drink tea myself at this hour. If he had said toast and water, it would have seemed no more than was suitable to such a frame of mind. As I followed him to the house, I thought that when the day came that Flurry Knox could not be bothered with fighting old Welby, things were becoming serious, but I kept this opinion to myself and merely offered an admiring comment on the roses that were blooming on the front of the house. I put up every stick of that trellis myself with my own hands, said Flurry, still gloomily. The roses were trailing all over the place for the want of it. Uh, would you like to have a look at the garden while we're getting tea? I settled it up a bit since you saw it last. I acceded to this almost alarmingly ladylike suggestion, marvelling greatly. Flurry certainly was a changed man, and his garden was a changed garden. It was a very old garden with unexpected arbours, madly overgrown with flowering climbers and a flight of grey steps leading to a terrace where a moss-grown sundial and ancient herbaceous plants strove with nettles and briars. But I chiefly remembered it as a place where washing was wont to hang on blackcurrant bushes and the kennel terrier matured his bones and hunted chickens. There was now rabbit wire on the gate. The walks were cleaned, the beds weeded, there was even a bed of mignonette, a row of sweet pea and a blazing party of sunflowers. And Mitel, once second in command in many a filibustering expedition, was now on his knees ingloriously tying carnations to little pieces of cane. We walked up the steps to the terrace. Down below us the rich and southern blue of the sea filled the gaps between scattered fir trees. The hillside above was purple with heather. A bay mare and her foal were moving lazily through the bracken with the sun glistening on it and them. I looked back at the house, nestling in the hollow of the hill, and smelled the smell of the mignonette in the air. I regarded Michael's labouring back among the carnations, and, without any connection of ideas, I seemed to see... Miss Sally Knox, with her golden-red hair and slight figure, standing on the terrace beside her kinsman. Michael, do you know where's Mr. Flurry? squalled a voice from the garden gate, the untrammeled voice of the female domestic at large among her fellows. The tail's wet. And there's a man over with a message from Arcelas. He was telling me the old hero beyond is giving out invitations. A stricken silence fell, induced, no doubt, by hasty danger signals from Michael. Um, who's um, the old hero beyond? I asked as we turned towards the house. My grandmother, said Furry, permitting himself a smile that had about as much sociability in it as skim milk. She's giving a tenant's dance at Arcelas. Oh, she gave one about five years ago, and I declare you might as well get the influenza into the country or a mission at the chapel. There won't be a servant of the place who'll be able to answer their name for a week after it, what with toothache and headache and, and blathering in the kitchen. We had tea in the drawing room a solemnity which I could not but be aware was due to the presence of a new carpet, a new wallpaper, and a new piano. 
Flurry made no comment on these things, but something told me that I was expected to do so, and I did. Ah, I'd sell you the lot tomorrow for half what I gave for them, said my host, eyeing them with morose respect as he poured out his third cup of tea. I have all my life been handicapped by not having the courage of my curiosity. Those who have the nerve to ask direct questions on matters that do not concern them seldom fail to exact direct answers, but in my lack of this enviable gift, I went home in the dark as to what had befallen my landlord and fully aware of how my wife would despise me for my shortcomings. Philippa always says that she never asks questions, but she seems nonetheless to get a lot of answers. On my own avenue, I met Miss Sally Knox riding away from the house on her white cob. She had found no one at home, and she would not turn back with me, but she did not seem to be in any hurry to ride away. I told her that I had just been over to see her relative, Mr. Knox, who had informed me that he meant to give up the hounds, a fact in which she seemed only conventionally interested. She looked pale and her eyelids were slightly pink. I checked myself on the verge of asking her if she had hay fever and inquired instead if she had heard of the tenants' dance at Orsalas. She did not answer at first, but rubbed her cane up and down the cub's clipped toothbrush of her mane. Then she said, Major Yates, look here, there's a most awful row at home. I expressed incoherent regret and wished to my heart that Philippa had been there to cope with the situation. It began when Mamma found out about Flurry's racing Sultan, and then came our dance. Miss Sally stopped. I nodded remembering certain episodes of Lady Knox's dance. And Mamma says, she, she, she says, I waited respectfully to hear what Mamma had said. The cob fidgeted under the attentions of the horseflies and nearly trod on my toe. Well, the end of it is, she said with a gulp. She said such things to Flory that he can't come near the house again, and I'm to go over to England to Aunt Dora next week. Will you tell Philippa I came to say goodbye to her? I don't think I can get over here again. Miss Sally was a sufficiently old friend of mine for me to take her hand and press it in a fatherly manner, but for the life of me, I could not think of anything to say unless I expressed my sympathy with her mother's point of view about detrimentals, which was obviously not the thing to do. Philippa accorded to my news the rare tribute of speechless attention and then was despicable enough to say that she had foreseen the whole affair from the beginning. From the day she refused him in the ice house, I suppose, said I sarcastically, that was the beginning, replied Philippa. Well, I went on judicially. Whenever it began, it was high time for it to end. She can do a good deal better than flurry. Philippa became rather red in the face. I call that a thoroughly commonplace thing to say, she said. I dare say he has not many ideas beyond horses, but no more has she, and he really does come and borrow books from me. Whitaker's almanac, I murmured. Well, I don't care. I like him very much. And I know what you're going to say, and you're wrong, and I'll tell you why. Here, Mrs. Kerrigan came into the room. Her cap at rather more than its usual warlike angle over her scarlet forehead, and in her hand a kitchen plate on which a note was ceremoniously laid forth. <laughs> but this is for you, Miss Cadogan, said Philippa, as she looked at it. 
Ma'am, returned Mrs. Caligon with immense dignity, I have no learning, and from what the young man's after telling me that bought it for Marcy Lass, I'd sooner yourself read it for me than them girls. My wife opened the envelope and drew forth a gilt-edged sheet of pink paper. Miss Margaret Nolan presents her compliments to Mrs. Caligon, she read, and I have the pleasure of telling you the servants of Ocelas is inviting you and Mr. Peter Caligon, Miss Mulrooney and Miss Gallagher. Philippa's voice quavered perilously. To a dance on next Wednesday, dancing to begin at seven o'clock and to go on till five. Yours affectionately, Maggie Nolan. <laughs> How affectionate she is, snorted Mrs. Caligon. Dems Dublin manners, I dare say. A P.S., continued Philippa. Steward, Mr. Dennis O'Loughlin, stewardess, Mrs. O'Manny. Thoughtful provision, I remarked. I suppose Mrs. Mahoney's duties will begin after supper. Well, Mrs. Cadigan, said Philippa, quelling me with a glance, I suppose you'd all like to go. As for dancing, said Mrs. Cadigan, with her eyes fixed on a level with a curtain pole, I thank God I'm a widow, and the only dancing I'll do is to dance to my grave. Well, perhaps... Julia and Annie and Peter, suggested Philippa, considerably overawed. I'm not one of them that holds that loud mockery and harangues, continued Mrs. Kerrigan. But if I had any wish for drawn down talk, I could tell you, ma'am, that the like of them has their share of dances without going to us, alas. <laughs> Wasn't it only last Sunday week I went folly in the turkey that's laying out in the plantation, and the whole of them hoisted their sails and back with them to their lovers at the gatehouse, and the kitchen maid having a Jew harp to be playing for them? That was very wrong, said the truckling Philippa. I hope you spoke to the kitchen maid about it. Is it speak to them? rejoined Mrs. Cadogan. No. But what I done was to drag the kitchen maid round the passages with the hair of the head. Well, after that, I think you might let her go to Ocelas, said I, venturously. The end of it was that everyone in and about the house went to Ocelas on the following Wednesday, including Mrs. Cadogan. Philippa had gone over to stay at the shoots ostensibly to arrange about a jumble sale, the real object being, as a matter of history, to inspect the Scotch young lady before whom Bernard Chute had dumped his affections in his customary manner. Being alone with every prospect of a bad dinner, I accepted with gratitude an invitation to dine and sleep at Ocelas and see the dance. It is only on very special occasions that I have the heart to remind Philippa uh, that she had neither part nor lot in what occurred. It is too serious a matter for trivial glorying's. Mrs. Knox had asked me to dine at six o'clock, which meant that I arrived in blazing sunlight and evening clothes, punctually at that hour, and that at seven o'clock I was still sitting in the library reading heavily bound classics while my hostess held loud conversation down staircases with Dennis O'Loughlin, the red-bearded Robinson Crusoe, who combined in himself the office of coachman, butler, and, to the best of my belief, valet to the lady of the house. The door opened at last, and Dennis, looking as furtive as his prototype after he had sighted the footprint, uh, put in his head and beckoned to me. The mistress says, will you go to dinner without her? He said very confidentially. So she's greatly vexed you should be waiting on her. Twas the kitchen chimney caught fire and fit. She's after giving Biddy Mahoney the sack on the head of it. Though indeed, tis little we'd regard a chimney on fire here any other day. Mrs. Knox's woolly dog was the sole occupant of the dining room 
when I entered it. He was sitting under his mistress's chair with all the air of outrage peculiar to a small and self-important dog when routine has been interfered with. It was difficult to discover what had caused the delay, the meal not accepting the soup being a cold collation. It was heavily flavoured with soot and was hurled onto the table by Crusoe in spasmodic bursts, contemporaneous, no doubt, with Biddy Mahoney's fits of hysterics in the kitchen. Its most memorable feature was a noble lake trout, which appeared in two jagged pieces, a matter lightly alluded to by Dennis as the result of a little argument between himself and Biddy as to the dish on which it was to be served. Further conversation elicited the interesting fact that the combatants had pulled the trout in two before the matter was settled. A brief glance at my attendant Sands decided me to let the woolly dog justify his existence by consuming my portion for me when Crusoe left the room. Old Mrs. Knox remained invisible till the end of dinner. When she appeared in the purple velvet bonnet that she was reputed to have worn since the famine and a dun-coloured woollen shawl fastened by a splendid diamond brooch that flashed rainbow fire against the last shafts of sunset, there was a fire in the old lady's eye, too, the light that I had sometimes seen in flurries in moments of crisis. I have no apologies to offer that are worth hearing, she said, but I have come to drink a glass of port wine with you, if you will so honour me, and then we must go out and see the ball. My grandson is late, as usual. She crumbled a biscuit with a brown and preoccupied hand, her toe-like fingers carried a crowded sparkle of diamonds upwards as she raised her glass to her lips. The twilight was falling when we left the room and made our way downstairs. I followed the little figure in the purple bonnet through dark regions of passages and doorways where strange lumber lay about. There was a rusty suit of armour, an upturned punt, mouldering pictures and finally... By a door that opened into the yard, a lady's bicycle, white with the dust of travel. I supposed this latter to have been imported from Dublin by the fashionable Miss Maggie Nolan, but on the other hand, it was well within the bounds of possibility that it belonged to old Mrs. Knox. The coach house at Ocelas was on a par with the rest of the establishment, being vast dilapidated and of unknown age. Its three double doors were wide open and the guests overflowed through them into the cobblestone yard. Above their heads, the tin reflectors of paraffin lamps glared at us from among the Christmas decorations of holly and ivy that festooned the walls. The voices of a fiddle and a concertina combined were uttering a polka with shrill and hideous fluency to which the scraping and stamping of hobnailed boots made a ponderous bass accompaniment. Mrs. Knox's donkey chair had been placed in a commanding position at the top of the room, and she made her way slowly to it, shaking hands with all the varieties of tenants and saying right things without showing any symptom of that flustered boredom that I have myself exhibited when I went round the men's messes on Christmas Day. She took a seat in the donkey chair with a white dog in her lap, and looked with her hawk's eyes round the array of faces that hemmed in the space where the dancers were solemnly bobbing and hopping. "'Will you tell me who that Tom fool is, Dennis?' she said, pointing to a young lady in a ball dress who was circling in conscious magnificence and somewhat painful incongruity in the arms of Mr. Peter Cadogan. "'That's the lady's maid from Castle Knox, Your Honour, ma'am,' replied Dennis, with something remarkably like a wink at Mrs. Knox. "'When did the Castle Knox servants come?' asked the old lady, very sharply. "'The same time Your Honour left the table, and... "'Pillaloo, what's this?' There was a clatter of galloping hoofs in the courtyard, as of a troop of cavalry, and out of the heart of it, Thoria's voice, shouting to Dennis 
to drive out the coasts and shut the gates before they had the people killed. I noticed that the colour had risen to Mrs Knox's face, and I put it down to anxiety about her young horses. I may admit that when I heard Flurry's voice and saw him colouring his grandmother's guests and pushing them out of the way as he came into the coach house, I rather feared that he was in the condition so often defined to me at petty sessions as not drunk, but having a drink taken. His face was white, his eyes glittered. There was a general air of exultation about him that suggested the solace of the pangs of love according to the most ancient convention. Hello, he said, swaggering up to the orchestra. What's this humbugging thing that you're playing? A polka, is it? Drop that, John Casey, and play a jig. John Casey ceased abjectly. What'll I play, Master Flurry? What the devil do I care? Here, Yeats, put a name on it. You're a sort of musician, or yourself? I know the names of three or four Irish jigs, but on this occasion my memory clung exclusively to one, I suppose, because it was the one I felt to be peculiarly inappropriate. Oh, well, haste to the wedding, I said, looking away. Flurry gave a shout of laughter. That's it! he exclaimed. Play it up, John. Give us haste to the wedding. That's Major Yates' fancy. Decidedly, Flurry was drunk. What's wrong with you all that you aren't dancing, he continued, striding off the middle of the room. Maybe you don't know how. Here, I'll soon get one that'll show you. He advanced upon his grandmother, snatched her out of the donkey chair, and, amid roars of applause, led her out, while the fiddle squealed its way through the inimitable twists of the tune, and the concertina surged and panted after it. Whatever Mrs. Knox may have thought of her grandson's behaviour, she was evidently going to make the best of it. She took her station opposite to him, in the purple bonnet, the dun-coloured shawl and the diamonds, she picked up her skirt at each side, affording a view of narrow feet in elastic-sided cloth boots, and for three repeats of the tune, she stood up to her grandson and footed it on the coach-house floor. What the cloth boots did I could not exactly follow. They were, as well as I could see, extremely scientific while there was hardly so much as a nod from the plumes of the bonnet. Flurry was also scientific, but his dancing did not alter my opinion that he was drunk. In fact, I thought he was making rather an exhibition of himself. They say that that jig was twenty pounds in Mrs. Knox's pocket at the next rent day, but though this statement is open to doubt, I believe that if she and Flurry had taken the hat round there and then, she would have got in the best part of her arrears. After this, the company settled down to business. The dances lasted a sweltering half hour, old women and young dancing with equal and tireless zest. At the end of each, the gentlemen abandoned their partners without ceremony or comment and went out to smoke while the ladies retired to the laundry, where families of teapots stewed on the long bars of the fire, and Mrs. Mahoney cut up mighty balm bracks, and the tea-drinking was illimitable. At ten o'clock, Mrs. Knox withdrew from the revel. She said that she was tired, but I have seldom seen anyone look more wide awake. I thought that I might unobtrusively follow her example, but I was intercepted by flurry. Yates, he said seriously, I'll uh, take it as a kindness if you'll see this thing out with me. We must keep them pretty sober and get them out of this by daylight. I, um, I have to get home early. I at once took back my opinion that Furry was drunk. I almost wished he had been. 
as I could then have deserted him without a pang. As it was, I addressed myself heavily to the night's enjoyment. Worn with heat but conscientiously cheerful, I danced with Miss Maggie Nolan, with the Castle Knox lady's maid, with my own kitchen maid, who fell into wild giggles of terror whenever I spoke to her, with Mrs. Cadogan, who had apparently postponed the interesting feat of dancing to her grave and did what she could to dance me into mine. I am bound to admit that though an ex-soldier and a major, and therefore equipped with a ready-made character for gallantry, Mrs. Cadogan was the only one of my partners with whom I conversed with any comfort. At intervals I smoked cigarettes in the yard, seated on the old mounting block by the gate, and overheard much conversation about the price of pigs in Scabon. At intervals I plunged again into the coach house and led forth a perspiring wallflower into the scrimmage of a polka, or shuffled meaninglessly opposite to her in the long double line of dancers who were engaged with serious faces in executing a jig or a reel, I neither knew nor cared which. Flory remained as undefeated as ever. I could only suppose it was his method of showing that his broken heart had mended. It's time to be making the punch, Master Flory, said Dennis, as the harness room clock struck twelve. Sure, the night's warm. And the men's all gaping for the creatures. What'll we make it in? said Flory, as we followed him into the laundry. The boiler, to be sure, said Crusoe, taking up a stone of sugar and preparing to shoot it into the laundry copper. Stop, you fool! She's full of cockroaches, shouted Flory, amid sympathetic squalls from the throng of countrywomen. Go get a bath. So yourself knows there's but one bath in it, retorted Dennis, and that's within the Major's room. Faith, the tinker got his own share yesterday with the same bath, striving to quench the holes, and they as thick in it as the stars in the sky, and tis weeping still after all he'd done. Well, then, here goes for the cockroaches, said Furry. What doesn't sicken will fatten. Give me the kettle. And come on, you, Kitty Collins, and be skimming them off. Uh, there were no complaints of the punch when the brew was completed, and the dance thundered on with a heavier stamping and a louder hilarity than before. The night wore on. I squeezed through the unyielding pack of frieze coats and shawls in the doorway, and with feet that momently swelled in my pumps, I limped over the cobblestones to smoke my eighth cigarette on the mounting block. It was a dark, hot night. The old castle loomed above me in piled-up roofs and gables, and high up in it somewhere, a window sent a shaft of light into the sleeping leaves of a walnut tree that overhung the gateway. At the bars of the gate, two young horses peered in at the medley of noise and people. Away in an outhouse, a cock crew hoarsely. The gaiety in the coach house increased momently, till... Amid shrieks and bursts of laughter, Miss Maggie Nolan fled coquettishly from it with a long yell, like a train coming out of a tunnel, pursued by the fascinating Peter Cadogan, brandishing a twig of mountain ash in imitation of mistletoe. The young horses stampeded in horror, and immediately a voice proceeded from the lighted window above, Mrs Knox's voice, demanding what the noise was, and announcing that if she heard any more of it, she would have the place cleared. An awful silence fell, to which the young horse's fleeing hoofs lent the final touch of consternation. Then I heard the irrepressible Maggie Nolan say, Oh, God, Mary come sad, which I take to be a reflection on the mutability of all earthly happiness. Mrs. Knox remained for a moment at the window, and it struck me as remarkable that at 2.30 a.m. she should still have on her bonnet. I thought I heard her speak to someone in the room, and there followed a laugh, a laugh that was not a servant's, and was 
puzzlingly familiar. I gave it up and presently dropped into a cheerless doze. With the dawn, there came a period when even Flurry showed signs of failing. He came and sat down beside me with a yawn. It struck me that there was more impatience and nervousness than fatigue in the yawn. I think I'll turn them all out of this after the next dance is over, he said. I have a lot to do, and I can't stay here. I grunted in drowsy approval. It must have been a few minutes later that I felt Flurry grip my shoulder. Yates, he said, look up at the roof. Do you see anything up there by the kitchen chimney? He was pointing at a heavy stack of chimneys in a tower that stood up against the grey and pink of the morning sky. At the angle where one of them joined the roof, smoke was oozing busily out, and as I stared, a little wisp of flame stole through. The next thing that I distinctly remember is being in the van of a rush through the kitchen passages, everyone shouting, Water! Water! and not knowing where to find it. Then up several flights of the narrowest and darkest stairs that has ever been my fate to ascend with a bucket of water that I snatched from a woman spilling as I ran. At the top of the stairs came a ladder leading to a trapdoor, and up in the dark loft above was the roar and the wavering glare of flames. My God, that strong fire, shouted Dennis, tumbling down the ladder with a brace of empty buckets. We'll never save it. The lake won't quench it. The flames were squirting out through the bricks of the chimney, through the timbers, through the slates. It was barely possible to get through the trapdoor, and the booming and crackling strengthened every instant. A chain to the lake, gasped Flurry, coughing in the stifling heat, as he slashed the water out of the blazing rafters. The well is no good. Go on, Yates! The organising of a double chain out of the mob that thronged and shouted and jammed in the passages and yard was no mean feat of generalship, but it got done somehow. Mrs. Cadogan and Biddy Mahoney rose magnificently to the occasion, cursing, thumping, shoving, and stable buckets, coal buckets, milk pails and kettles were unearthed and sent swinging down the grass slope to the lake that lay in glittering unconcern in the morning sunshine. Men, women and children worked in a way that only Irish people can work on an emergency. All their cleverness, all their good-heartedness, and all their love of eruption came to the front. The screaming and the exhortations were incessant, but so were also the buckets that flew from hand to hand up to the loft. I hardly know how long we were at it, but there came a time when I looked up from the yard and saw that the billows of reddened smoke from the top of the tower were dying down, and I bethought me of old Mrs. Knox. I found her at the door of her room, engaged in tying up a bundle of old clothes in a sheet. She looked as white as a corpse, but she was not in any way quelled by the situation. I'd be obliged to you all the same, Major Yates, to throw this over the balusters, she said as I advanced with the news that the fire had been got under. Pon my honour, I don't know when I've been as vexed as I've been this night, what with one thing and another. It is a monstrous thing to use a guest as we've used you. But what could we do? I threw all the silver out of the dining room window myself, and the poor peahen that had her nest there was hurt by an entree dish, and half her eggs were... There was a curious sound, not unlike a titter, in Mrs. Knox's room. However, we can't make omelettes without breaking eggs, as they say, she went on rather hurriedly. I declare I don't know what I'm saying. My old head is confused. Here, Mrs. Knox went abruptly into her room and shut the door. Obviously, there was nothing further to do from my hostess, and I fought my way up the dripping back staircase to the loft. The flames had ceased. The supply of buckets had been stopped, and Flurry, 
standing on a ponderous crossbeam, was poking his head and shoulders out into the sunlight through the hole that had been burned in the roof. Dennis and others were pouring water over charred beams. The atmosphere was still stifling. Everything was black. Everything dripped with inky water. Flory descended from his beam and stretched himself, looking like a drowned chimney sweep. We've uh, made a night of it, Yeats, haven't we? He said. But we've bested it anyhow. We were done for, only for you. There was more emotion about him than the occasion seemed to warrant, and his eyes had a Christy minstrel brightness not wholly to be attributed to the dirt of his face. What's the time? I must get home. The time, incredible as it seemed, was half past six. I could almost have sworn that Flory changed colour when I said so. I must be off, he said. I had no idea it was so late. Why? What's the hurry? I asked. He stared at me, laughed foolishly, and fell to giving directions to Dennis. Five minutes afterwards, he drove out of the yard and away at a canter down the long stretch of avenue that skirted the lake with a troop of young horses flying on either hand. He whirled his whip round his head and shouted at them and was lost to sight in a clump of trees. It is a vision of him that remains with me and it always carries with it the bitter smell of wet, charred wood. Reaction had begun to set in among the volunteers. The chain took to sitting in the kitchen. Cups of tea began mysteriously to circulate, and personal narratives of the fire were already foreshadowing the amazing legends that have since gathered round the night's adventure. I left Dennis the task of clearing the house and went up to change my wet clothes with a feeling that I had not been to bed for a year. The ghost of a waiter who had drowned himself in a bog hole would have presented a cheerier aspect than I, as I surveyed myself in the prehistoric mirror in my room, with the sunshine falling on my unshorn face and begrimed shirt front. I made my toilet at considerable length, and, it being now nearly eight o'clock, went downstairs to look for something to eat. I had left the house humming with people. I found it silent as Pompeii. The sheeted bundles containing Mrs. Knox's wardrobe were lying about the hall. A couple of ancestors, who in the first alarm had been dragged from the walls, were leaning drunkenly against the bundles. Last night's dessert was still on the dining room table. I went out onto the hall door steps and saw the entree dishes in a glittering heap in a nasturtium bed, and realised that there was no breakfast for me this side of lunch at Sri Lane. There was the sound of wheels on the avenue, and a brougham came into view, driving fast up the long open stretch by the lake. It was the Castle Knox brougham, driven by Norris, whom I had last seen drunk at the athletic sports. And as it drew up at the door I saw... Lady Knox inside. It's all right. Uh, the fire's out, I said, advancing genially and full of reassurance. What fire? said Lady Knox, regarding me with an iron countenance. I explained. Well, as the house isn't burned down, said Lady Knox, cutting short my details. Perhaps you would kindly find out if I could see Mrs. Knox. Lady Knox's face was many shades redder than usual. I began to understand that something awful had happened, or would happen, and I wished myself safe at Trelane with the bedclothes over my head. If tis for the mistress you're looking, me lady... Dennis's voice behind me in tones of the utmost respect. She went out to the kitchen garden a while ago to get a blast of the fresh air after the night. 
Maybe your ladyship would sit inside in the library till I call her. Lady Knox eyed Crusoe suspiciously. Thank you. I'll fetch her myself, she said. Oh, sure, that's too trouble, began Dennis. Stay where you are, said Lady Knox in a voice like the slam of a door. Be dad. I'm best place she went, whispered Dennis, as Lady Knox set forth alone down the shrubbery walk. But is Mrs. Knox in the garden? said I. The Lord, preserve your innocence, sir, replied Dennis, with seeming irrelevance. At this moment, I became aware of the incredible fact that Sally Knox was silently descending the stairs. She stopped short as she got into the hall and looked almost wildly at me and Dennis. Was I looking at her wraith? There was again a sound of wheels on the gravel. She went to the hall door, outside which was now drawn up Mrs. Knox's donkey carriage, as well as Lady Knox's broom. And as if overcome by this imposing spectacle, she turned back and put her hands over her face. She's gone round to the garden, a store, said Dennis in a hoarse whisper. Go in the donkey carriage. It will be all right. He seized her by the arm, pushed her down the steps and into the little carriage, pulled up the hood over her to its furthest stretch, snatched the whip out of the hand of the broadly grinning Norris, and with terrific objurgations lashed the donkey into a gallop. The donkey boy grasped the position, whatever it might be. He took up the running on the other side, and the donkey carriage swung away down the avenue with all its incongruous air of hooded and rowdy invalidism. I have never disguised the fact that I am a coward, and therefore when at this uh, dynamitical moment I caught a glimpse of Lady Knox's hat over Laura Stinnis as she returned at high speed from the garden, I slunk into the house and faded away round the dining room door. This minute I seen the mistress going down through the plantation beyond, said the voice of Crusoe outside the window. And I'm after sending Johnny Reagan to her with a little carriage, not to put any more delay on your ladyship. Sure you can see him uh, making all the haste he can. Maybe you'd sit inside in the library till she comes. Silence followed. I peered cautiously round the window curtain. Lady Knox was looking defiantly at the donkey carriage as it reeled at top speed into the shades of the plantation, strenuously pursued by the woolly dog. Norris was regarding his horse's ears in expressionless respectability. Dennis was picking up the entree dishes with decorous solicitude. Lady Knox turned and came into the house, she passed the dining room door with an ominous step and went on into the library. It seemed to me that now or never was the moment to retire quietly to my room, put my things into my portmanteau, and... Dennis rushed into the room with the entree dishes piled up to his chin. She's diddled, he whispered, crashing them down on the table. He came at me with his hand out. Three cheers for Master Flory and Miss Sally, he hissed, wringing my hand up and down. And twas yourself called for haste to the wedding last night. Long life to you. The Lord save us. There's the mistress going into the library. Through the half-open door, I saw old Mrs. Knox approach the library from the staircase with a dignified slowness. She had on a wedding garment, a long white burnoose in which she might easily have been mistaken for a small, stout clergyman. She waved back Crusoe. The door closed upon her, and the battle of giants was entered upon. I sat down. It was all I was able for, 
and remained for a full minute in stupefied contemplation of the entree dishes. Perhaps of all conclusions to a situation so portentous, that which occurred was the least possible. Twenty minutes after Mrs. Knox met her antagonist, I was summoned from strapping my portmanteau to face the appalling duty of escorting the combatants in Lady Knox's broom to the church outside the back gate to which Miss Sally had preceded them in the donkey carriage. I pulled myself together, went downstairs, and found that the millennium had suddenly set in. It had apparently dawned with the news that Ocelas and all things therein were bequeathed to Flurry by his grandmother and had established itself finally upon the considerations that the marriage was past praying for and that the diamonds were intended for Miss Sally. We fetched the bride and bridegroom from the church. We fetched old Eustace Hamilton, who married them. We dug out the champagne from the cellar. We even found rice and threw it. The hired carriage that had been ordered to take the runaways across country to a distant station was driven by slipper. He was shaved. He wore an old livery coat and a new pot hat. He was wondrous sober. On the following morning, he was found asleep on a heap of stones ten miles away. Somewhere in the neighbourhood, one of the horses was grazing in a field with a certain amount of harness hanging about it. The carriage and the remaining horses were discovered in a roadside ditch. Two miles farther on, one of the carriage doors had been torn off, and in the interior, the hens of the vicinity were conducting an exhaustive search after the rice that lurked in the cushions. <laughs>